just getting started for Olivia Rodrigo as she celebrates the release of her sophomore album. Congratulations on release day. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a very exciting few hours. You draw quite a crowd, my friend. She's calling it Guts. These are my, my Guts rings. And the critics are calling Rodrigo a rock star. And Guts means what to you in the context of this album? It means a few things. It means courage. It means trusting your gut. It means having, you know, following your intuition. I like spilling your guts too. I feel like there's some of that on this yeah, album. Yeah, I feel like every song I've ever written is sort of just me spilling my guts a little bit. Just 20 years old, the singing songwriting phenom has a talent for turning angst and heartbreak into hits. Do you ever, when you're sitting down spilling your guts in front of a piano, do you ever have any hesitation of like, ooh? Maybe I shouldn't go this far. Maybe I shouldn't tell this one. It doesn't feel like it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, in the moment when I'm writing a song, I try not to censor myself too much or think about, you know, what people on the internet are gonna say about it. Um, just because I think that is kind of the antithesis of creativity. But yeah. um, it's you know it, after after the fact, then it's kind of when you have to be like strategic, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> but it's out there now, so. It's out there. Let it ride. People have had a lot to say about Rodrigo's music ever since she exploded onto the scene with her Grammy-winning debut album, Sour. It's brutal out here. Rolling Stone called Sour Rodrigo's greatest hits album on her first try, highlighted by the five times platinum driver's license. I got my driver's license last week, just like we always talked about. A poignant power ballad about marking a teenage milestone amid heartache. You said forever. With a bridge embraced by TikTok. And Saturday Night Live. I was thinking back to January of 2021 when Driver's License came out. You're still a <laughs> senior in high school, mm -hmm. and then you wake up one morning and everybody knows your name, and everyone's singing that song. Mm -hmm. With two and a half years of perspective on that now, how do you describe what that was like? It's really interesting. I feel like at the time, I didn't quite realize how much it would change my life. In the moment, I was just so full of adrenaline. I'm like, hey, let's get the next song out. Let's do the album. And it wasn't until recently where I really had the space and time to take a step back and be like, whoa, that was insane. That was, you know, such a huge moment for me, something that I'll remember when I'm 85. And I love that song so much just for me. I wrote that song and, and, and loved it because it's just so acutely expressed what I was going through at the time. And the fact that it resonated in the way that it did is just so meaningful. I, I owe so much to that song and it opened so many doors for me. So um, just full of so much gratitude for and it. As it's setting streaming records and going to number one and SNL is doing an entire <laughs> sketch on it. Yeah. And you're watching this happen to your song and to your life. What What's going through your mind? What are you thinking? How are you handling that? Honestly, a healthy level of dissociation goes a long way, yes. I think. Yeah. Uh, when I was 17 or 18, you know, you just can't really read into all of that too much. You kind of just have to put your horse blinders on and focus on what you can control because so much of it is just beyond anything you could really fathom or, or control, you know. And then you proved that it wasn't just about that song. I mean, <laughs> you put out another one, a hit, another one, a hit, and it became the biggest album of the year. Again, Rolling Stone called it the best album of the year so as you were sitting down now to write guts did you feel like okay this better be good did you feel all that when you were putting this album together so much pressure you know everyone always says like your only competition is yourself and i was like oh god if my only competition is myself i don't know how i'm gonna beat this like that was just such crazy success that i could have never expected or prepared myself for and so i i definitely i mean i won't lie i had a really tricky time setting out to make guts but I think kind of halfway through the writing process, I sort of shifted my mindset into not trying to beat something or, or, or make a song that would go number one. And I just tried to make songs that I would like to hear on the radio. 
and that's when kind of the real good stuff started happening. I had a lot more fun, and the songs really improved. Um, so, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you just have to focus on doing what you love and making songs that you enjoy. That's all you can do. You have such a maturity in your songs about things like heartbreak and relationships, even on Sour. And as you say, you were 16, 17 years old writing these sort of sophisticated songs that I'm not sure most teenagers <laughs> have thought through in that way or can articulate in the way that you have. Where does that, I guess, emotional maturity come from? How do you think so deeply and express it so well at your age? Thanks. I mean, I've been writing songs since I could talk. I've always <laughs> been doing it. So I've written so many songs in my life, written so many bad songs, got a lot of practice. But I, I, I really believe that really good songs kind of don't come from you, they kind of come through you, you know? It's, it's, it's kind of like something else. It's like a, a magical thing. And sometimes you write a song and you're like, wow, I don't even know how that came to be. It's just, um, it's just kind of this beautiful flow. So I, I credit a lot, of, a lot of my songs to that sort of magic. The magic began in Southern California, where Rodrigo grew up with parents who played Alanis Morissette. Gwen Stefani and the White Stripes in the house. Do you get deja vu? Huh? Rodrigo first sat down at the piano at seven. By 12, she was writing songs. She did some acting too, but music Just a city boy. was her first love. Do you remember those first songs when you were 12? Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> I listen back to that. I still have them on my phone and I'm like, Gosh, I was so angsty. I had such a perspective. I'd write all these like feminist songs about like all these like people that wronged me or like all these issues that I had. And I'm like, you're in sixth grade. Like what? What's going on? Rodrigo since has sharpened the songwriting around that angst and proven herself a sharp businesswoman as well. When she signed her first record deal at just 17, she negotiated for ownership of the master recordings of her music. The label agreed, perhaps underestimating her potential. How did you have the instinct to do that? How did you negotiate that? Because it has paid off in a way that other artists have, have struggled with. I think that I've been really lucky to be surrounded by people who really look after me and take care of me in a very real, genuine way. That's something that I, I really have never taken for granted. It's, it's super instrumental, I feel like, in my career. And uh, I don't know, I, I've, I've just really always wanted to have total creative control over everything that I do. Like the money part and all of that is great and fun, but um, it's just so freeing to be able to say whatever you want, express how you feel however you want, and, you know, be in control of, of your life and career. That's something that's just so meaningful to me, and I, I feel really happy that I'm in a position where I can have that. I hate to give the satisfaction asking how you're doing now. On Guts, Rodrigo goes full pop punk. Well, just so you know, most mortals don't have number one hits oh. flowing through their bodies <laughs> when they sit down at a piano. But I think Maybe. Vampire was that way a little bit too, wasn't it? Where you sat down at a piano and it just sort of yeah. happened? Yeah, I was getting ice cream with my friends and I was really upset about this thing that I wrote Vampire about. and. I just had this burning desire to sit down at the piano, and I'm sitting down at the piano, and the chords just came, and I was like, oh, vampire, I don't know, it just popped into my head. I, I you know, hadn't really ever thought about writing a song like that, and uh, yeah, it just kind of came really naturally. So why is it so important to you, because this is true of all your songs, to not talk publicly about who or what exactly it's about? I think explanation is never good for <laughs> art. Why would I like pigeonhole a song into being about this one thing in my life when Everyone has their own interpretation. It's the beauty of music. It just makes me feel less alone in my feelings. You know, when I write the song about some specific instance that where I felt this really strong way and then I look out into the crowd and I see some girl who felt the exact same way, it just makes me realize that, you know, we're all so much more alike than we are different and no one's ever really alone in their feelings. Is it still a trip to you to have that feeling, which is to say, to go out on a stage, a song you wrote maybe with one other person in the <laughs> privacy of a little room mm -hmm. and you feel like I, maybe someone will connect with this, to hear an entire arena or an entire stadium singing those words back to you? Yeah, I think it's a feeling that you never really get used to. I think songs are, are one of the most 
powerful mediums there are, you know, uh, you can write a song in 20 minutes and, you know, a, a huge crowd of 5,000 people could sing every word, you know, uh, it's just, it's really powerful. There's a, there's a lot of responsibility in that, I think. She has grown up during this whirlwind couple of years, but she's still having fun. The first album was very much about heartbreak, and I love that. That's what I needed to say at the time. I was very heartbroken. And I think this time around, I was just more thinking about the pressures of young adulthood and, you know, sort of the growing pains that um, come along with just turning 20. I, I wrote the album when I was. 19 and 20, and uh, I think it also just takes itself a lot uh, less seriously, which I, I really enjoy. It's very playful and fun, and I just wanted to make songs that would be really cool to sing at a concert and jump around to, so I feel like that's what we tried to do. So you've said that the last couple of years you've grown up by a decade, much more <laughs> than the two years or so. Yeah. How much are you different today than you were when you were writing those songs for Sour? Oh my gosh, I'm a completely different person. I mean, I wrote all those songs for Sour when I was 17 and I'm 20 now. And obviously my life has changed drastically. You know, my career and my environment, everything's so different. Um, but I just think all of that pales in comparison to how much you change as an individual from the ages of 17 to 20. Yeah. I feel like I learned so much about myself and who I wanted to be and the people that I wanted to surround myself with. And um, you sort of just, yeah, I have sort of this new confidence that I didn't have before. People have called you the voice of your generation. <laughs> They've said that you've sort of captured what it means to be your age or close to your age in this moment in time. Do you have any sense for what that means exactly? <laughs> no, oh my gosh, it's so, so crazy. That's such a, wow, that's a, that's a really big title. Because you're just telling your own story, yeah. but it just so happens to reflect what a lot of people are going through. All I can do is be myself, I think, and write songs that I like. And um, I think the fact that people gravitate towards them is amazing.
Kane Brown's road to country stardom began in an unlikely place. I started in a bathroom, as weird as that sounds, just doing songs and covers in a bathroom. From the bathroom to the biggest stages in music, Brown recently finished his sold out Drunk or Dreaming international tour. It's gotta feel good as an artist to be yeah. able to travel the world and fill up those arenas. You're not, we're not just talking about, you know, Atlanta and Chattanooga yeah. anymore. Like, you're a global star. What does that feel like? I mean, dude, it feels amazing, um, especially like coming from where I came from, my background, getting to go to, you know, Australia. I never really left Georgia. So now I'm getting to travel the world to do music, and it makes absolutely no sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm thinking about is how I'm homesick. The son of a white mother and a black and Native American father, Brown was raised in northwest Georgia and southeastern Tennessee. His childhood was marked by periods of homelessness, abuse at the hands of a stepfather, and racism. Brown found stability with his grandmother and solace in music. Poverty, abuse, racism, all the things you encountered as a young man, how much does that childhood, which was difficult by your own admission, how does that inform your music? Do you still feel it when you're sitting to write a song? Um, not as much as I did when I first came in. And I still, I wanna go back to that. But I feel like I've told a lot of my story. And, and I have noticed like as I keep going and more of my story opens up, especially on stage, like I, now it's, it's, it's went even further and, and I feel like that's going to happen. It's going to lead to something else and, and maybe a documentary or a movie or something, which I think would be really cool. Where did it start for you? Where did you get that bug for? Not, not necessarily I'm going to grow up and be a, a, a star, but like I just like singing. I like playing. I like listening to music. How did that start for you? Oh, uh, well, music was always my life. That was kind of my escape, even though I didn't realize it coming up through my childhood. It started coming out more when I started working at Lowe's and in the meantime, like while I was mixing paint, I was singing. My buddy ended up hearing me and told me to try out for the talent show. So then when I tried out for the talent show, um, I got like an encore. And so then that was like kind of what sparked me wanting to sing. And then I just started posting it to Facebook. Did your uh, coworkers like that you were singing on the job? Yeah, yeah. He was <laughs> like, man, you gave me cold chills. And I didn't know what to think about it. I was like, really? And uh, <laughs> that's, you know, that's what sparked everything. I'm very competitive. So then once, you know, people told me that they liked it, then I was like, I wonder how many other people I can get to like it. And it started way back in third grade. In between shifts at Lowe's and later FedEx, Brown posted covers of country hits to Facebook. His rendition of Lee Bryce's I Don't Dance, recorded in the bathroom, exploded while he slept. Yeah, I was that kind of man. I remember waking up and my phone was completely black and put it on the charger and immediately once it turned on I just got notifications for hours. I couldn't unlock my phone, I couldn't do anything, it just kept popping up. I remember it being 60,000 followers overnight Wow! and I thought that was big and then fast forward and then I, I did a George Strait check yes or no and 60,000 turned into millions and then that's when I started just writing my own music. <laughs> so what was it like the next day at work? Uh, well, this time, now I'm at FedEx. Okay, <laughs> so, okay, you moved on. And so I was uh, coming in late to work, you know. I, I was taking multiple lunch breaks, going, <laughs> doing covers in my car. And my boss was cool with it, because uh, he liked to watch the numbers go up with me. We'd post it, and I'd be like, it would just immediately just flood my inbox. And so he would just sit there and watch it with me, thought it was the coolest thing. And uh, he wanted to see how far I could go. And I get a, a call saying that we need you to move to Nashville. He just told me, he's like, yeah, man, go. And then you can come back if you need to. So it was a, a assurance thing for me. Brown moved to Music City to chase the dream. What were some of the reactions you heard from people in Nashville? No, I wouldn't say it was just Nashville. I'd say it was everywhere. I mean, was especially the internet. They'd be like, just look at him. He's not country. That's not what country looks like, yada, yada, yada. But I feel like it's also what made me blow up on Facebook because, I mean, I had a lot of people that they clicked my video and they're like, I thought you were going to rap. <laughs> and then I started singing, so it kind of it shocked them and then they wanted to share it. You say what if I heard you? Brown proved his doubters wrong, releasing a self-titled debut album in 2016 featuring his first number one song, 
What ifs. What if I was made for you and you were made for me? What if this is it? What if it's meant to be? And the nine times platinum smash, Heaven. I don't know. continues to defy country conventions. He has crossed over to the pop charts with hits like One Thing Right, a collaboration with DJ Marshmallow. How do you describe your sound? I think it kind of just evolves over time. When I first got into music, I was really scared of everything. I was like, well, if I do this wrong, if I do this wrong, and now it's just I get to be myself, and I wish I would have got to do that from the beginning, but it's hard, man. You, know, you, you, you want to be successful, and you feel like you got to play the, by the book and all this stuff. Um, but it, you know, I did, and it helped me get here, and now it helps me get to open up. Now, the other rumor about you is you're a good basketball player. I'm True. okay. What's your game like? I got to scout you real quick. Oh, uh, well, it's getting, I'm getting older, so it's getting a little slow. <laughs> Dude, if you're old, where do you see me out there? Hey, I don't know what it is. The other day, I, I played at my house, and it's been a couple months, and uh, my lower back was hurting me for like four days. Mm. My shins hurt for like nine days. <laughs> I was popping Advil. I, I mean, I take Advil before I play now, so that's just telling you. The preemptive Advil yeah. is the first step toward middle age yeah. basketball guy. What position did you play in high school? I played small forward. Shot a lot of threes. I had to get in there and get some rebounds, too. How about you? Uh, I was all over the place, yeah. Not center. So are you, is it true that you are the only artist ever to play every NBA arena on a tour? We were eating at lunch one day, and they were like, would you want to play every NBA arena? I said, of course. Yeah. And you can make it happen. So yeah. my team made it happen. There hey, I made it. I've played sports my whole life, so when I get to do these things, it's just so memorable because I'll never play in the NBA. <laughs> but, you know, I got to play inside of the NBA ring. So. We've both come to terms with the fact we're not going to play in the NBA. No. Despite what you're seeing here today. If somebody wants to give us a look, you know? See what I mean? I just spot up shoot now. That's it. I, hey, I see it. Oh. <laughs> got to leave on a made one. There he is. There we go. This is it. Hundred percent. Still hasn't missed. Doing it his way, Brown is filling stadiums and making history. This summer, he became the first black artist ever to headline a concert at Boston's famed Fenway Park. When I started playing bigger places, I got like imposter syndrome. It moved too fast. I wasn't the greatest on stage. I wondered what everybody thought about me. I was so nervous to be on stage because I'm a very shy guy. Uh, but whenever I'm on stage, I'm the guy that I 
wish I was all the time. You're going to be on a lot of stages singing it coming up on this new tour. I don't know how much you can say yet, but we're talking big venues yep. starting next year. We're doing six stadiums, uh, which I'm really excited about. Take me back to people that call my people, yeah, yeah, I'm on my way. When we did Fenway, I knew that I was supposed to be there. Mm. Fenway was very iconic to me. And when I got out there, you know, there was no nerves. There was no, oh my God, it was like, it's showtime. And I'm gonna, you know, put on a show and let these people know that I'm so glad they're here. Brown shared the stage that night with his wife, Caitlin, a singer herself. The couple has two young daughters and a number one hit. Thank God your hand fits perfectly in mine. Another cool element about your performance is performing with your wife. Right, yeah. singing "Thank God" with your two beautiful little girls, maybe somewhere in the stadium. Hey, they're yeah. asleep. <laughs> they're out. <laughs> By the time you come on, they're done. Yeah. Uh, how cool is that? Not only to perform with Caitlin, but also to have it become such a hit. Thank God. It was awesome. I knew it was going to be a hit from the start. You know, uh, we we met through music, and once we found this song, we used to do covers and stuff and put it on YouTube. And so my fans knew that she sung, uh, but not the whole. You know place, country world, whatever. And we found this song when we put it out. She was nervous. And I was like, babe, this song's gonna be a smash. It don't even have to go to radio. Like, it's gonna be a smash because my fans have been waiting on it and you're amazing. But I remember when, before we went out on stage at Fenway, she was like, I'm gonna throw up. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm gonna throw up. I was like, just look at me. I'm right here. Everything's gonna be okay. And then she came out, she killed it. And then everybody lit their phones up and sang it back uh -huh. to us. It's her first number one. And it was just amazing for her. And I was glad that I got to be a part of it. You don't know what the response always is gonna be. Mm -hmm. And then to walk out at Fenway Park with your wife and have 35, 40,000 people singing every word back to you. What is that feeling like? Uh, I mean, it's the best feeling in the world, man. So that raises the question, will you and your wife now, because that was such a hit, is there going to be more music from oh, the, the two of you? Yeah, of course, yeah. We're actually working on it right now. Um, just finished my studio, so hopefully we get it a lot more. Maybe she'll jump on a ride, too. She <laughs> says she's a little rusty. But, um. <laughs> I bet she's all right. It's amazing to look at the charts, particularly this summer, but in general, and you've been right up at the top of them, how country has gone so mainstream and to see the top three or four songs not just in country but in all music be country it feels like you were part of a wave of a new generation of people who are taking country to a different place does it feel that way to you at all i just do my own thing and <laughs> i don't even you know look at that type of stuff um i just do my my music i just love that i can be all over the place and be myself and, and not be worried about it, and then people can come to my shows and still have fun. Only ones I keep around me is my fam. No coincidence, it's always been the plan. Do you stop and have moments, and you go, man, it's a long way from here back to the Facebook videos and the, the childhood I had. I just don't think about it, because I feel like, you know, everything that I went through was a part of my life that got me here. And I'm actually proud of it, even though a lot of it was tough and hard, and you didn't know what was going to come out of it. but. I feel like that's who made me who I am today, it made me strong, it made me want to give back to people, it made me humble, and just made me proud of who I am and where I came from.
it's, it's a it's treasure cool. trove. Yeah, it's just all kinds of, this is fun stuff. I could get lost in this all day. So this is the rehearsal space? This is the rehearsal now? space. Yeah. This is where, you know, we've pretty much got this set up as we would set up on our stage at a show. It's a, like a playhouse, I imagine, for a musician. You it's, come in here, guitars and drums and whatever else you yeah, need. Yeah, it's a candy store a little <laughs> bit. So, and it's a, it's a place to put all that stuff, you know, and and have it out and, you know, oh, yeah, let's grab that and see what this does, you know. And then you might find a hit song, just grabbing things off the wall. Well, that's the <laughs> hope, you know, that's the hope. But also the hope is just that, you know, you get to make the, make the sounds that give the vibrations that make it feel like the right thing, you know. Baby. No one oh, finds those vibrations quite change. like Chris Stapleton. This might sound strange, but... On his latest album, the 45-year-old reaches back to his earliest days in Nashville, long before the world knew his name. The t title track, Higher, is, what, what year is it? It's 22 years old, 23 years old. And that's some, one of the, that was all, song was on the first demo session I ever did when I moved to town as a songwriter. So I wrote that song by myself, and, and it's been hanging around ever since. So, so that's 2001. You've yeah. just come to town, your first demo. Yeah. So that's been sitting there waiting to be something for a couple of decades. How do you decide when to pull that one off the shelf and put it in an album? Well, that one's pretty... Uh, high level of difficulty as far as uh, singing goes and um, for me maybe not for somebody you're up else, there but yeah some of those notes <laughs> and uh, I don't know I, I think I was probably afraid of it for a long time and my wife was would always would always push for that song and she was like you should try that and I was like I don't, I don't know if I have it right now I don't know if I have that one anymore you know because like I wrote it when I was 23 you know like and you get to be in your 40s you're like oh, maybe I don't have what I used to have <laughs> but I've been working with a really uh, great vocal coach named Rob Stevenson, who has helped me really, you know, not only get back some of the things that I thought I didn't have anymore, but find some other other range that's well, really nice. So where we cut that song is about, it's at least a step, maybe a step and a half higher than it was when I did the demo. In oh, is that right? So wow. you know, it was a little bit of a, you know, like a challenge to myself to try to do it, I think. So, um, and that one, that one was, you know, little bit of a battle to get but we got it you've got range with this thing that extends your range well it's <laughs> yeah it's uh that's me on a good day <laughs> so much stapleton taking that one-of-a-kind voice even higher question i think i've never asked you or talked to you about is when you first realized your voice was special or different? Was there a parent or a music teacher or somebody who said, because your voice is so distinctive? Well, my parents always told me I was special and different, <laughs> as any good parent would, you know, but. Um, was it early in your life? Was it when you got to Nashville? When did people say, hmm, there's something different about him? I, I always sang, so that was always like one of, one of my things that I would do. I think at some point, people only maybe regard it as special or something when you start to have some kind of notoriety with it, you know, mm. like, otherwise you're a dude that sings, you know, like, there's lots of people that can sing, you know. Well, the road rolls out like a welcome night. I don't know anybody who sings like you. In other words, the way that voice comes out of that beard well, that takes, is different. I think that that maybe takes, uh, even when I moved to town, if you listen to things from when I moved to town, I'm not the same singer. You know, I spent a lot of time trying to be other people, you know, like, uh, I love Vince Gill. I've, I've, I've tried so hard to be Vince Gill and sound like Vince Gill. There's lots of, lots of recordings of demo recordings of me like wishing I was Vince Gill, or you know, um, but I'm not. I'm not any of those people. And, and eventually, you hopefully through all those influences and um, also focusing on what it is that you do, um, you find out what that is, and then you put that out there, and, and that's if that's some something special that people think is special. That's great. Stapleton found his voice for good in 2015 with his Grammy-winning debut solo album, Traveler. I'm just a traveler on this earth. In the eight years since, he has earned eight Grammys, won 15 Country Music Association awards, and most recently was named the Academy of Country Music's Entertainer of the Year. In February, another milestone for Stapleton, when he was invited to stand alone on one of the world's biggest stages. Oh, and you see 
What is the level of nervousness going into the Super Bowl uh, anthem? Terrified, exponentially beyond belief. <laughs> but the national anthem is a hard one yeah. for any singer. I don't care who you are on a number of levels because you can be immortalized for really screwing it up or you can do a passable, serviceable job and everybody's like, all right, cool, he, he got it right. Or, you, you know, hopefully you get something beyond that. But just to get through it, if you get through it, there's, there's this, your shoulders drop and, and you go, okay, I didn't screw any of that up. I don't have to hear about it forever. I, I, you know, there's no, I didn't fall down or, you know, there, it, it's, a, it's a lot of eyes on that song and a lot of judgment on that song if you, if you get it wrong. So I might have worked on that more than I worked on anything <laughs> to do uh, for any television performance ever. But I was very nervous. I had a sinus infection that day. So I didn't do, I shot away from some things that I might have done mm. as, a, as a singer that day. But whoever, what well, really the power of that after I watched it, and I didn't, I don't like to watch things back, but people are like, man, you should really go watch it. Go watch it. Whoever did all the edits with the coaches and the, yeah. the guys on the, on the ship and the, and, and the fly, the, it, was a, it was a really brilliant bit of editing in my mind that really made it feel maybe more powerful than it would have, you know, with just me doing it. Were you aware afterward that the Eagles head coach had tears coming down his face, that Jason Kelsey was choked up and that you had a role in that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I was aware after people were like, oh, you made, you know, you're making people cry. I was like, oh, okay, good. I'm going to go watch the game. <laughs> and, you know, I was, you know, there's a lot of coming down off of something like that where you're just like, all right, I, I did it. I did it. I, I did that thing. And the whole of a so now the debate is Whitney Stapleton, the best Super Bowl anthem of all time. So well, I'll, I know you won't I'll weigh in on I'll that. I'll defer. <laughs> this is the chair that I have sat in for every record that we've made, but it. It was in my parents' uh, little kitchenette, but I always have carried this chair with me. I moved to town with this chair. And so I sit in this chair anytime I'm um, making records and I'm, and I'm sitting down. Sometimes I'm standing up. But if I'm sitting down in a, in a creative capacity, this is the chair. So, What's the significance of it to you? It's a comfortable chair. <laughs> that, <laughs> but, uh, so, that's where it ends. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the main part. As, as I get older, but um, it, uh, you know, I like to have little things with you that, that you carry with you through time. And I think those things inform what we do in ways that maybe you can't completely understand. But uh, if you have those little bits with you while mm -hmm. you're doing it, uh, whether it's a thing or a mentality or whatever it is, I think that that's good. I think that's a good thing. So that's it's that's familiar. It's home. It's familiar. So, it's home. Yeah, yeah. it feels so, comfortable. Stapleton also finds the comfort of home standing next to him on stage. Sing my Sarah, he and his talented wife Morgan, who met as young songwriters and now share five children, write, produce, and perform together. Broken halos that used to shine. White Horse is the hit that's out right now, yeah. first single off the album. What is that song about exactly? And is it true that when you ran it by Morgan, as you do everything, she was like, I don't know. I don't well, know that's, that, yeah, that song's the, the, the reverse of higher. It's just like I would bring that one up because I <laughs> like rock. I like guitar licks and stuff. That's, yeah. that's how I hear things. I, I don't think of songs as lyrical things. Or uh, I, I, It takes me so long to hear lyrics in a song. I want to hear all the other stuff first. I'll listen to everything in a song mm. maybe 10 times before I even hear what somebody's saying. And if all that stuff feels good to me, then I'll start paying attention to what the lyrics are. So I think of songs in the reverse of most, uh, maybe songwriters, but maybe people in general, I don't know. But I think those things are important to me more than yeah. uh, lyrics are even. But I always liked that groove. And, and uh, me and Dan Wilson wrote that song and uh, yeah, I always just wanted to, we played it, we used to play it out live a long time ago, uh, pre, pre-Traveler, pre and it just kind of crept back up. I said, well, maybe we can try it again and 
if we hook it, maybe you'll be okay with it. <laughs> and I, I think she, she she liked it after we, we got it. I think what I'm hearing so far, Chris, is Morgan gets approval on these songs. Oh, of course. Yeah. Or at least discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, be like, hey, just let me have this one thing, you know, like. Well, she's got good taste. Oh, yeah, great. So, and everything but men, that's what I like to say. <laughs> I don't know, I think she did all right. said Higher was uh, written in 2001 for, for a demo, and that's the title track on this album. Does that give you a moment of pause to look back at the last 22 years and to think, my gosh, I came to Nashville hoping some of this would maybe happen, and it's so far exceeded my dreams? Is it a marker for you? Certainly, there's always moments to reflect, and I've talked about, uh, I think, a lot of times in interviews, how songs, but gain meaning over time or the meanings change over time and so i don't know exactly how that's going to hit me when i hear it out in the world or see how people respond to it i think i'll have different feelings that's when the songs get meaning to me is when people assign the meaning to them you know i can think a song means one thing and i can write it and i can sing it and then it goes out into the world or you see people singing it back and you see that it means something to them that's probably not what you intended, mm. or maybe it's exactly what you intended, but it, you see it in real time. It's gotta be something when a stadium full of people sings any song that you sat in a room and wrote, and they love it so much and it means so much that they know all the words. It doesn't get old. It's, it's a really humbling and addictive experience, you know, at the same time. You know, you, when you hear that, it's a, it's a buzz, you know, to, to hear that. On a Nashville ride from struggling songwriter to music icon, Stapleton still prefers to let his songs be the stars. I don't do this for the fame part. It's that I was never, that's not a thing I like to chase. I'm in it for the music part mainly and the fun part, you know. And we're well beyond that, that you know, that's how I make a living. But um, that's, uh, yeah, that's what I'm in it for.
Okay, this is our conference room. Believe it or not, this was my dining table. Is that true? <laughs> it is true. You really are a scrappy organization. <laughs> Scarlett Johansson has been scrappy from the start. On screen. <laughs> and now in business with the launch of her skincare line, The Outset. I want to talk about the outset a lot. <laughs> I'm here for the eye cream. Great. The Colin Jost eye cream, yeah, as I understand it. <laughs> That's how it's commonly known as, yeah. <laughs> but let's start, if we can, with Asteroid City. Sure. Which is an amazing Wes Anderson film. Beautiful to look at, as all of his stuff is. My word, it's hot. Johansson plays Midge Campbell, a 1950s movie star forced to quarantine in the fictional desert town of Asteroid City. You were very good in the one about the tramp in the brothel Thank who you. gets amnesia and Thank becomes you. a pediatrician. You were very authentic. Actually, maybe my favorite character I've ever seen. I don't know why nobody else liked it. Oh. So what is that phone call like when Wes says, not only do I want you in the movie, but I wrote a part for you? It's like a career dream goal, um, definitely. I was very excited to read a script in its entirety of his, which I never had the chance to do. And... It was in the middle of COVID, the, right in the middle of COVID. So I was not expecting to get any calls about work. I'd sort of, you know, just kind of had taken a bit of a pause, I guess. It was a, it was a, it was a time that felt all over the place. And so I, yeah, I, I read the script and I, I play a few different characters in this film. So I play an actor who's playing an actor who's also preparing a play. Um, so it has, it's, there was a lot to discuss. I had to wrap my head around. I don't like the way that guy looked at us, the alien. Well, how did he, how did he look Like at we're us? doomed. Maybe we are. As with every Wes Anderson movie, there may be no point exactly into asking what it's about because it's kind of an experience, but how do you describe this film to people who are thinking about going to see it? The film is really a sort of exploration in existentialism. It's, I think, a film that's made, it's very reflective of where Wes is at, I think, in his life and career. You know, the, the fact that it was written and developed during the quarantine time um, is definitely baked in there. Um, it's very self-reflective. And I think it's also a celebration of creativity and the nomadic circus that actors create around themselves, hmm. um, you know, that is something that I think it comes up in Wes's work a lot, that real fondness and celebration of that environment. So how do you describe the Wes Anderson experience? It's so cool to look at, obviously, and fun to watch. All of his films are. But on the other side of it, as an actor, what does that mean? How is it different from other things you've done? Well, I, I think Wes's love of that nomadic circus is really, you know, a, it's also represented in how in the environment that he creates on set. We were very isolated um, in a town called Chinchon, which is in Spain in an agricultural area, you know, really l never left our, our compound um, where we were all staying. And this whole world was created on a watermelon farm um, so all the earth and all the, all the mountains and everything were brought in and built this practical set in the middle of nothing and, you know, just agricultural land. And so it just, it was very surreal, but also so magical. I mean, you would, it was so unique. I've never experienced, I mean, I'd say doing theater is maybe the closest thing that I would, could describe it to, liken it to. It was, it was, it's such a beautiful family that he, that he surrounds himself with of, of, you know, family he chooses. So let's talk about Midge specifically. Mm -hmm. You read her on the page. Did you get her right away? What did you think about the character? I, I actually had to read it a couple of times. Um, my character Midge is a, she is a, you know, movie star. Um, she is beloved. She is kind of, narcissistic and self-involved um, in, a, I think, a way that's kind of, it, that's very um, alluring and enigmatic. And um, she's aware that she's constantly being 
watch, you know, that's just an ingredient in her life that's always there. And, and she doesn't mind that at all. And she's, you know, I, we looked at just what actors I could kind of hang my hat on and, um, you know, of that era whose career could we emulate. And um, I think Betty Davis was who we both liked. And I just love her. I love her whole spirit and, and, and her vulnerability, her strength, her groundedness. Like she feels to me, you know, very authentic. And, um, and so that's who we kind of base her on. So yeah. th- this role came to you at a complicated time was, for you as well, <laughs> to say the least. It wasn't. It, well, it wasn't initially that complicated. <laughs> initially, it was wide open and great. But as we waited for the window of time to shoot because of COVID and all the regulations, um, you know, I I, I got pregnant, um, and I was very happy to be pregnant. But I I knew that you know I had this obligation to shoot this film and, and uh, nonetheless, I at some point had to tell Wes that I was pregnant because I thought, I, you know, I guess this couldn't, maybe isn't gonna push for as long as I need it to. And, um, and in true Wes fashion, he was so excited that I was pregnant. And he said, how long do you think you're gonna need <laughs> post, you know, post birth? And I said, I don't know, maybe like, I guess eight weeks or something. So on my eight week <laughs> postpartum date, I was flying to Spain and with my young, you know, eight week old baby and Colin. And, um, so that was another wow. added piece to the experience that was so, it was wonderful. I mean, it was so wonderful. It was, it was challenging, but it was also completely unexpected. And I, you know, I felt so fortunate and grateful to be able to, to still be able to participate, you know, and then I got to bring my infant baby to the table and it could be held by Adrian Brody and Willem Dafoe and <laughs> Brian Cranston and everybody else. So. The stories he will have, his <laughs> earliest babysitters, all Academy Award winners. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Johansson's own story begins in New York's Greenwich Village, where she grew up with dreams of starring in the Broadway musicals she saw with her mother. She began to audition and landed her first film role at just nine years old in Rob Reiner's North. After working steadily as a child actress, Johansson was thrust into adult stardom by her performance alongside Bill Murray in the acclaimed 2003 movie, Lost in Translation. I just don't know what I'm supposed to be. I forgot how young you were when you made that. I mean, 17, you're just, you're a high school kid, basically yeah. being thrust into this world. Was that a hard thing to have that many eyes on you and to be treated now as an adult effectively after that movie? I mean, I think just being that age is hard anyway. I felt like I was at a crossroads at that time because I, you know, Lost in Translation had come out and Girl with a Pearl Earring and I did some very exciting work, but then I felt like the work that was out there for me anyway was not, it just was sort of uninspired and I didn't know I thought, oh, I can't, I don't want to do work that's uninspiring. I would rather do another, some other thing. She found the fire again on Broadway, starring and winning a Tony Award in the 2010 revival of A View from the Bridge. Which sort of brings it full circle, the song and dance and the performance in your living room with your family. Yeah. Not only to come to Broadway and do Arthur Miller, but to win a Tony Award. That must have been thrilling. It was thrilling. Our production was so incredibly received and feel totally welcomed by this amazing community I admired for my entire life and feel that thrill of being on stage every night and the unexpected, you know, have that, oh, it just, it's so exciting and makes you feel like alive, you know? And then it's the same year, I think it's the same year as the play that um, Black Widow and Iron Man 2 come along, right? Right. By a twist of fate, all of a sudden, now you're in the Marvel Universe. So yeah. you're at this crossroads where you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> to winning a Tony, and now you're in a Marvel movie, and then a bunch that came after that. Right. What did the Marvel movies do to your career and your life, just in terms of like joining this world that people are so invested in and so many people are aware of and watch it? Yeah. How much fun was that to be a part of? I didn't know whether... I would be accepted by the, you know, by the this massive fan base that was already there. It was so early days in that genre. I mean, the way that it was 
then it was just the beginning. I mean, we were on the set of Avengers going, this is either going to be, we're having an amazing time with all these incredible actors and yet we don't know, you know, this could be right. really <laughs> awful. I mean, it's so crazy. You have, I remember going, there's a Nordic God, we have a mutant, this like rich playboy turned robot guy. I'm a Russian spy. It was just like, this is a recipe for disaster. Somebody that's been frozen in ice and comes up. It's like, but then here we are. This is home. Yeah, that's the home away from home. When Johansson is not on set, she's here in the offices of The Outset, the skincare company she co-founded just over a year ago. This is our like best selling okay. sort of trio. It's our cleanser, our prep serum, and our daily moisturizer. I'm just realizing I don't do enough. Yeah. I have no night creams. What? I don't have, no. But you're on camera all the I time. I know, I know. I need to get more serious about my career. Well, I know. <laughs> So what compelled you to take on this challenge? Since I was probably 12, 13 years old, have struggled with acne. And when I was younger, it was all about sort of stripping away your skin and, you know, basically resurface your entire face. <laughs> right. And at some point I, you know, it was like, I have to kind of just stop everything and just try something else, which was just using very clean, moisturizing products and stop like stripping everything away. And that's when my skin completely transformed. Mm. So is it true that um, Colin is a big proponent of the eye cream? Yes. That's his thing? Colin was our eye cream mm -hmm. connoisseur. I never used eye cream before and <laughs> Colin uses it every day. And so I thought, well, why don't, since, you know, it was during COVID and I didn't have so many people to test it on in my, <laughs> Colin became our, our eye cream expert. Wow. And um, I got him to switch to the outset eye cream. So. And he looks great. He's never looked better. <laughs> so youthful. He is. He's like de-aging. It's very annoying. Look at you. You're doing it all. And with a toddler at home. I mean, it's all very impressive. I mean, I'm sure I left like the <laughs> oven on or whatever. But, yeah. Over now. Oh. 
right? He's just about to get started. It is hard work being John Luther, the good cop with a dark side, played for more than a decade now by Idris Elba. Because I'm ready. It looks like a lot of fun as a viewer to play this character. Nope. No? no. Just brutal because you're getting beat up so much? Getting up at 4 a.m. <laughs> in the rain, cold. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just like, can we do a Luther where he's uh, in Hawaii? <laughs> and there's like, you know, uh, maybe it's a tropical storm, so there is some rain, <laughs> but not so cold. I smell a sequel. 100%. Hawaii. 100%, yeah. <laughs> Luther, Luther in Jamaica. <laughs> I mean, I say it isn't fun. I've played him for 10 years and he's yeah. one of my, you know, sort of dearest characters, if you like. Elba has played several. In this country, he is known best, perhaps, as drug dealer Stringer Bell from the iconic HBO drama, The Wire. No matter what we call heroin, it's gonna get sold. But in Elba's native UK, Luther looms large. The popular five season BBC series now spun into the new movie, Luther, The Fallen Son. For me, playing a detective on the other side of the fence, you know, Stringer on as a drug dealer and Detective Luther, for me, that was like, yeah, I get to reinvent something and myself, actually. And um, there's something about Luther being this forthright character that will stop at nothing. Mr. DCI John Luther, well, I mean, it's not. I, um, I was a DCI in your department. John Luther is an ordinary detective with sort of extraordinary circumstances, but very relatable, you know? We're not talking about end of the world crime. We're talking about guys that have real bad sort of ethics, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And he, he can't stand that. But what the film has now given us is taking this central character Luther, and putting him in these landscapes, in these scenarios uh, that could be as epic as the ones that James Bond sort of covers, you know what I mean? And I hope people kind of go, wow, James versus John, you know what I mean? Like, I really hope that. Don't think I didn't notice. There's a moment at a bar, you're sitting there. I'd say a long day calls for a martini. Yeah. Whiskey. I remember seeing that in the script and was like, <laughs> Are we sure, bro? I mean, this is like, it's right on the nose. Was that a nod to the outside calls for you to play James Bond? Not purposely, but you know, <laughs> I think uh, those who know, know. It's a great moment. So now you've, you've certainly raised the question then com with the Bond comparison, the franchise anyway, of sequels. Mm. It feels to me, having just watched the movie, like there's more to come. Yeah. Fair to say, or at least that's the way you'd like it to go? Uh, I think it's fair to say that. Yeah, I think that the ending, again, really sort of opens that door for one of the possibilities. Where does John go next? And I think that's quite on purpose. Yeah. Um, I think we all, you know, have a sort of wish to take a, a few chapters and, and see this landscape grow and grow. I, I do. I mean, I feel like there's so much we can offer. Because Lutherland is really wherever Luther goes. Mm. So if, if we saw Luther in Colombia and it had that same sort of Luther aesthetic and it's dark, you know, I think that would still be as engaging as seeing him in sort of London as we know it. Elba was born and raised in London's working class Canning Town, the son of African immigrants. How and when was the seed to become an actor planted? How did you get to that place from a place that was so far from Hollywood or show business? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I knew in high school, secondary school for, for me, that I wanted to be an actor. I knew that at the age of 16, that this was sort of my career path. I just didn't know how to get there. And as soon as I left school, I sort of, you know, got into college. And I sort of did a performing arts course, which sort of covered all the bases. But it was right there when I sort of got introduced to method acting and Robert De Niro. I just became fixated. So I was 19 after two years of college. You know, I worked with my dad. My dad worked at Ford's Motor Company. I worked with him for a little bit. And then I saved enough money and I was like, I'm going to New York. And everyone's going, all my friends were like, you're going where? What? New York? What's in New York? Who do you know? I was like, my career's in New York. I want to go to New York. It's like, it's like <laughs> you're not even acting. You're not even an actor yet. You want to go to New York? Good luck. 
And it wasn't it wasn't easy for many, many years yeah. finding jobs. You were DJing and bouncing and paying your rent and doing yeah. all the things you had to do to yeah. survive. So what were those early years in America like for a young struggling actor? You know, I think I'd saved up somewhere like 36,000 pounds and used it all within six months. Mm -hmm. And I was broke and I was not booking jobs. Casting directors were interested, but not really. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, don't come to a place where they already have hamburgers. You have to come with something <laughs> different. Okay? So there's really good actors here. But I just came with this dream and then I was really, I'm, I'm a tenacious guy, you know, I, I stick at it. And so is it true that when the script for The Wire came your way, you were in the Astro van? Is there any yeah. truth to that? <laughs> yeah. You were spending a few nights in the van? Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was a very tough time. I was married at the time and and uh, my wife and I were going through a very bad time. You know, she was pregnant. It was just a rough time. Mm. I could barely scrape enough money for our, you know, unborn child. And I lived in a van for a little bit. Uh, but at the time, I was auditioning during the day. And, you know, my daughter was due to be born sort of like early January. And we're talking about November now. And this script comes in. It's like, you know, this is a pilot. You know, again, I was seeing really good casting directors by this junction, okay? This pilot's come in, it's called The Wire. Go in to see the guys, but do yourself a favor, don't speak in your own accent, you know? Just keep it uh, American. And I, I did, and quite frankly, I, it was the moment that my daughter was born, I literally got the phone call that, hey, you know, we want to offer you the role. The of same Stringer day? Bell. Yeah. Exactly the same yeah. I don't know if you believe in fate, but there was something going on that I, day. I mean, of course I do. That's incredible. Do. It, was incredible. A, it was a really special time. Changed my life. Changed my, my daughter's life, you know. What did that mean to you professionally then when that show became such an iconic series and such a success and everyone knew your name and your face and you weren't this close anymore, you were there. Yeah. What did that mean as you went forward in your career? You know, it just restored my faith, man. Like that's yeah. bottom line, you know what I mean? It's really easy to sort of sort of have no faith, but when when stuff's really tough and you're just, you know, should I give up or shouldn't I? Mm. Don't give up. As bleak as it's my, and honestly, that story, you couldn't get any more bleak than that. You know what I mean? Like, I have a child come in, I'm broke, I'm living in, a, in America, in New York City. And then, you know, there it came. So it meant a lot to me. It was a life changer. Um, it changed my life financially, obviously, but it really did catapult my career into essentially, you know, what I'm, I'm still dining off that, that life changing moment. Right. I mean, why work harder than you should? <laughs> no, I... Whether you're talking about The Office or Mandela. A just shell in the whole of South Africa. Luther, of course, and all these amazing series mm. and going to the Marvel Cinematic Universe <laughs> um, and getting all these opportunities. Talk about night and day where you couldn't, you couldn't find couldn't a job. Book. And now yeah. all of a sudden it's like, we want you to be in all these Marvel movies. Yeah. It's got to be sort of a head trip to say, I can sort of have my choice now of things that I want to do. Definitely, yeah. Someone asked me the other day, like, do you still audition? And I was like, no. Like, it was, <laughs> it was like an arrogant moment. I was just like, no, I don't audition ever, you know? Um, it, it's a very, very different scenario now. Have yeah. you ever had a chance to tell De Niro how he inspired you? You know what? No. Oh, we got to make that happen. I know. I, I mean, I, I've said it in so many interviews, and I was like, "Why am I going to meet De Niro?" And I'm like, "Dude, you, you actually inspired me." You know, he had a, an office down in um, Tribeca. Tribeca. Yeah. I, I literally fanboyed out one day and just went to his <laughs> office, and uh, I think he. I, I had read in the stage that he was um, the, the, the stage newspaper mm -hmm. that he was holding auditions for a, a Bronx Tale. It was his film he was directing. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, I, I gotta be in this, you know what I mean? I gotta find a way to be right. in it. And uh, so I show up and I said, oh, I've got an audition at the front desk. And they're like, he goes, yeah, go up to the next floor. So now I know I'm blagging this, right? I'm like, wow, I'm going <laughs> up to the next floor. This must be where Bob De Niro is. And this woman comes out and she's like, hi, who are you? I said, oh, uh, my name's Idris, uh, here's my resume. She's like, how did you get in this building? I said, oh, 
I'm auditioning for a Bronx Tale. She's like, honey, we already did the auditions. I'm just curious to know how you got in here. Ooh. I was like, um, well, I just did some research and I, I hustled it. She was like, wow, you, you got some nuts on you, boy. I tell you, I have to. Um, okay, I'll take your resume, uh, but we don't have any more auditions. Wow. See you later. Wow. True story. Wow. And I was like, okay. You know, it would be fun if we went down there right now and did that again. <laughs> I'm here to see Bob. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Elba also is an accomplished DJ who has booked Coachella twice and one royal wedding. His other passion started as a side hustle long before acting paid the bills. We play a song and there's 5,000 people hands in the air. That energy, you can't get that in films. You can get that maybe in theater, but it's not as reactive. When it's working, it's incredible. Mind you, when it's not working, geez, like, Do you even have nights like that? Even yeah. though they go, oh, Idris Elba's here, that's great. I, I think I always have nights like that. My team would be like, you're too hard on yourself. I'm like, no, I just didn't hit it. I didn't hit it how I need to. Yeah. That's how you keep it sharp, though. 100%. That's how you keep it sharp. 100%. Um, I just feel like listening to your journey at moments like this, when you're out celebrating this big Netflix movie you have, you must have a moment of pause and go, man, I worked for this. <laughs> you know, I came a long way, not just from New York City, but going back to your hometown mm. and working in that Ford plant. Mm. Do you pause and think, man, I've hustled my way pretty far here? Yes, I do. There's no doubt about that. But you know what? I still feel like I've got so much to offer. You know what I mean? I still feel like that guy that's sort of waking up in the van going, today's the day. I really do, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that I'm greedy or anything, it's just that I never really want to lose that sort of inquisitive, what can I do, what can I offer, how can I shop and how can I achieve? I never want to lose that. And next up, Luther goes to Hawaii. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Hawaii, Jamaica, Yeah, just Columbia, somewhere warm with warm, palm bro. trees, right? Yes, 100%. <laughs> Thank you, man, this Thank was you fun. Much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.
not supposed to eat lunch on camera. I've heard. We'll see how this goes, Henry. Whenever Henry Winkler visits his hometown, he stops here at the famed Katz's Delicatessen for a pastrami on rye. I grew up with you with happy days. Oh. Now you, you have to do this. It is a pilgrimage he's been making since happy days brought the native New Yorker West to Los Angeles exactly 50 years ago. What would you like to say to the people of the 21st century, huh? E Hi. Hi. How are you? I want a nice, juicy, nut lean on rye. Extra pickles. Pastrami, right? Yeah. That's the best. I'm going to wear this in. There's no. I'm going to rub it on my body. It's so good. Good to see you again. Nice Let's to see you. Me. Thank you. Thanks. I'm watching you just operate in a room like this, which I imagine is every public moment of your life, and watching you embrace all of this. Watch you embrace when coming up. The Fonz, hey! <laughs> Were you always that way about the Fonz, or was there a time always. where you tried to get away from him so you could beat something else? I saw else? it. I could beat the system. I saw it. I could beat. If I was conscientious and was not the Fonz off screen, I thought, I'm going to beat being typecast. Hmm. And so the lesson is you don't beat the system. You work with the system. Hmm. And you are patient with the system. And eventually you get here to have a sandwich with you. This is comfort food for mm. Winkler. This is New York. Right here, this is it. right now. Whose mother and father fled the Nazis in Germany and landed on the Upper West Side of New York. Winkler gets deeply personal about his fraught relationship with his parents in the new memoir, Being Henry, The Fonz and Beyond. But where did even the idea of becoming an actor come from? Because really? it's certainly not from your parents. I have no idea. Mm. I was always a performer. Uh, my parents had a party. I would put on uh, my mother's bathrobe. I would put on uh, rouge. I would come out. I would tell something that I thought was like hysterically funny. Then I would say, directed by Henry, produced by Henry, wow. written by Henry, costume by Henry, and disappear. But it sounds, reading your book, it sounds like it's not that they, it's not just that they didn't support what you wanted to do, it's that they sort of looked down on it in some way. And they thought, why would you go and chase this when you could have all this? Well, they had this art, they had the finesse of looking down on everything. My father was truly insulted and angry mm. that I was not going to be Winkler and Sons. That was his dream. That was his dream, yeah. to be an extension of who he is. Right. And that is impossible. He spoke 11 languages, I had trouble with English. As a child, Winkler had trouble reading and writing. Years later, when he was in his 30s and struggling through table reads, doctors diagnosed it as dyslexia. I did a musical in my 11th grade, and it was my uh, music teacher, Mr. Rock, who said one sentence to me, Winkler, if you ever do get out of here, you're gonna be great. And that moment, which may have felt small to him, was rocket fuel for you. Rocket fuel. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, it ignited me. I have, I still have it in my heart, hmm. that one sentence. And you take it with you to college. I do. You take it to Emerson, then you right. take it to Yale. Right. I mean, you're really right, now, doing I, it. Yale was like, I don't, do I have the nerve? I gotta apply, I gotta try. Mm -hmm. I get in, I'm one of 25, 11 finished. I'm one of three that's asked into the professional company. On the advice of his agent, Winkler moved to Hollywood. His very first week there, he landed a walk-on role on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Hello, I'm Margaret Geddes. Steve Waldman. How do you do? Well, I was just fired. <laughs> Sunday, Monday, happy days. Happy Wednesday, days soon follow. Well, let me tell you something. You're not going anywhere, lady. The Fonz wants to dance. So we got to talk about the Happy Days audition. Okay. Was it intimidating? Were you aware of how big the part could be? I'm. I was intimidated by dust. 
I saw a dust bunny and I apologized <laughs> and walked around it. <laughs> Did I know what it was? I had six lines. Yeah. I'm still under the spell of the Yale Drama School. I said to my agent, I don't know, do I want to go and do a, a series? She said, will you just shut up and go and meet the people at Paramount? I said, of course, I will do that. I've learned to improvise because I can't read off the page for years auditioning. The man reading with me, Pasquale, he said, are you ready? I said, do not talk to me that way. And do not look me in the eye, all right? I mean, who do you think you are? You took a step forward, take a step back. I am now, I am now outrageous. I am now just improvising all over the place. I haven't even gotten to the six lines yet. What are you looking at? And then I threw the script up in the air and I sauntered out of that room. They called me on my birthday, October 30th. 1973, said, would you want to play this role? I said, I'm going to think about it. Yes, I would. <laughs> but Winkler found it difficult to shake the fonts when Happy Days wrapped in 1984 after 11 seasons. What are we doing here? What's the plan? The plan? You're our lawyer. In the two decades before booking steady gigs as the incompetent lawyer Barry Zuckerkorn on Arrested Development and acting coach Gene Cousinow on Barry. I'll be there 945 to warm you up. Wait, you're, you're going to come with me? Absolutely. Every actor who's got a first audition brings a scene partner. Winkler did a little directing, a little producing, and wrote best-selling children's books. Look at that. Say hi. Winkler is a grandfather now. Now, Papa's on the wall somewhere. And only recently has started to heal the wounds of his childhood through therapy. Imagine that the, the napkin is little me. I was so confused and a browbeat that I covered over with cement. Now, about nine years ago, I met a talking doctor, and only then did I start to break chunks of this thick cement. You know how, like, uh, like little um, uh, seedlings come through s uh, the sidewalk, finding its way mm. through the cement to the sun? That's what's happening. I am on my way to being who I am, as opposed to having lived who I thought I should be. Wow. And that didn't start until you were 70 years old or something, right? And I say, I am so angry that it has taken me so long. I have wasted so much time. Because being who you are, is like freeing it is it's like i it it, it it is really it is the wind that allows you to fly mm. so if i was sitting with you 10 years ago at this table i would be guy funny from me. i would be i would be closed mm. i would double think what i'm going to say to make me look a certain way it was like i was in a um in uh, an oil can you know one of those big uh, that they play yeah, down in the caribbean soldered clothes mm. praying that there is no leak that can expose me coming out of those wow. solders and now i with glee smash that solder with everything I'm worth. It's a gusher now. Oh, it's all man. coming out.
what did the therapist say to you or bring out of you that allowed for this transformation? Because I think all of us have that in some way. I asked her one question, sat down, first time, hey, how are you? Hi, Henry, you know, I'm here, need help. So, how many children? And she said, how is that gonna help you? Mm. And I said, oh, okay. And then she forced me to answer the questions that I was asking. I could not have done Barry without having met that doctor. I could not have done that character with that kind of texture. That's so interesting. So you were in the place, right when that came to you, you were finally ready for something like that. Still the old Henry, scared out of my mind, the new Henry coming up against it, and now tentatively pushing back and the old Henry didn't want to give in. And the new Henry was able to, to do some scenes that I, are some of my favorite scenes ever. That was one of the first big tests for the new Henry. One of the first tests of the new Henry. Yeah. I never thought of it that way, but it is exactly right. And why do you think that character resonated and that show worked so well? The show was so original and it had a point of view. When you see a show that kind of is like mealy, yeah. the writers, they have a great idea, but the commitment is not there. Mm. Some writers put together a lot of words in a sentence, and, and some people put together a sentence much shorter that you light a fuse, and you better get out of the way. Mm. Bill Hader and Alec Berg are brilliant. The curtain is up and the spotlight is on you. And welcome to Gene Cousinow's Masterclass. Winkler's performance in Barry earned his first Primetime Emmy Award at 72 years old. You think about the phases of your professional career and all the things you've been able to do. It's incredible. Yeah, but you don't know right. until you try. And here we are. And here we are. And I'm very happy to be with you. It was a great scene. Now we can really jam the rest of it in our face. Yeah. is just getting started for Olivia Rodrigo as she celebrates the release of her sophomore album. Congratulations on release day. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a very exciting few hours. You draw quite a crowd, my friend. She's calling it Guts. These are my, my Guts rings. And the critics are calling Rodrigo a rock star. And guts means what to you in the context of this album? It means a few things. It means courage. It means trusting your gut. It means having, you know, following your intuition. I like spilling your guts too. I feel like there's some of that on this yeah, album. Yeah, I feel like every song I've ever written is sort of just me spilling my guts a little bit. Just 20 years old, the singing songwriting phenom has a talent for turning angst and heartbreak into hits. 
Do you ever, when you're sitting down spilling your guts in front of a piano, do you ever have any hesitation of like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't go this far, maybe I shouldn't tell this one? It doesn't feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, in the moment when I'm writing a song, I try not to censor myself too much or think about, you know, what people on the internet are gonna say about it, um, just because I think that is kind of the antithesis of creativity, but yeah. um, it's, you know, it, after, after the fact, then it's kind of when you have to be like, strategic I suppose I don't know <laughs> but it's out there now so it's out there let it ride if someone tells me one more time enjoy your youth I'm gonna cry people have had a lot to say about Rodrigo's music ever since she exploded onto the scene with her Grammy winning debut album sour it's brutal out here Rolling Stone called Sour Rodrigo's greatest hits album on her first try, highlighted by the five times platinum driver's license. I got my driver's license last week, just like we always talked about. A poignant power ballad about marking a teenage milestone amid heartache. You said forever. With a bridge embraced by TikTok. And Saturday Night Live. I was thinking back to January of 2021 when Driver's License came out. You're still a <laughs> senior in high school, mm -hmm. and then you wake up one morning and everybody knows your name, and everyone's singing that song. Mm -hmm. With two and a half years of perspective on that now, how do you describe what that was like? It's really interesting. I feel like at the time, I didn't quite realize how much it would change my life. In the moment, I was just so full of adrenaline. I'm like, hey, let's get the next song out. Let's do the album. And it wasn't until recently where I really had the space and time to take a step back and be like, whoa, that was insane. That was, you know, such a huge moment for me, something that I'll remember when I'm 85. And I love that song so much just for me. I wrote that song and, and, and loved it because it's just so acutely expressed what I was going through at the time and the fact that it resonated in the way that it did is just so meaningful. I, I owe so much to that song and it opened so many doors for me. So I'm um, just full of so much gratitude for and it. As it's setting streaming records and going to number one and SNL is doing an entire <laughs> sketch on it yeah. and you're watching this happen to your song and to your life. What What's going through your mind? What are you thinking? How are you handling that? Honestly, a healthy level of dissociation goes a long way, yes. I think. Yeah. Uh, when I was 17 or 18, you know, you just can't really read into all of that too much. You kind of just have to put your horse blinders on and focus on what you can control because so much of it is just beyond anything you could really fathom or, or control, you know. And then you proved that it wasn't just about that song. I mean, <laughs> you put out another one, a hit, another one, a hit, and it became the biggest album of the year. Again, Rolling Stone called it the best album of the year so as you were sitting down now to write guts did you feel like okay this better be good did you feel all that when you were putting this album together so much pressure you know everyone always says like your only competition is yourself and i was like oh god if my only competition is myself i don't know how i'm gonna beat this like that was just such crazy success that i could have never expected or prepared myself for and so i i definitely i mean i won't lie i had a really tricky time setting out to make guts but I think kind of halfway through the writing process, I sort of shifted my mindset into not trying to beat something or, or, or make a song that would go number one. And I just tried to make songs that I would like to hear on the radio. And that's when kind of the real good stuff started happening. I had a lot more fun and the songs really improved. Um, so yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you just have to focus on doing what you love and making songs that you enjoy. That's all you can do. You have such a maturity in your songs about things like heartbreak and relationships, even on Sour. And as you say, you were 16, 17 years old writing these sort of sophisticated songs that I'm not sure most teenagers <laughs> have thought through in that way or can articulate in the way that you have. Where does that, I guess, emotional maturity come from? How do you think so deeply and express it so well at your age? Thanks. I mean, I've been writing songs since I could talk. I've always <laughs> been doing it. So I've written so many songs in my life, written so many bad songs, got a lot of practice. But I, I, I really believe that really good songs kind of 
don't come from you. They kind of come through you. You know, it's it's, it's kind of like something else. It's like a, a magical thing. And sometimes you write a song and you're like, wow, I don't even know how that came to be. It's just um, it's just kind of this beautiful flow. So I, I credit a lot of a lot of my songs to that sort of magic. The magic began in Southern California, where Rodrigo grew up with parents who played Alanis Morissette, Gwen Stefani, and the White Stripes in the house. Do you get deja vu? <laughs> Rodrigo first sat down at the piano at seven. By 12, she was writing songs. She did some acting too, but music Just a city boy. was her first love. Do you remember those first songs when you were 12? Yeah, it's so funny. I listen back to that. I still have them on my phone, and I'm like, gosh, I was so angsty. I had such a perspective. I'd write all these, like, feminist songs about, like, all these, like, people that wronged me or, like, all these issues that I had. And I'm like, you're in sixth grade. Like, what? what's going on? Rodrigo since has sharpened the songwriting around that angst and proven herself a sharp businesswoman as well. When she signed her first record deal at just 17, she negotiated for ownership of the master recordings of her music. The label agreed, perhaps underestimating her potential. How did you have the instinct to do that? How did you negotiate that? Because it has paid off in a way that other artists have, have struggled with. I think that I've been really lucky to be surrounded by people who really look after me and take care of me in a very real, genuine way. That's something that I, I really have never taken for granted. I, it's, it's super instrumental, I feel like, in my career. And uh, I don't know, I, I've, I've just really always wanted to have total creative control over everything that I do. Like the money part and all of that is great and fun, but um, it's just so freeing to be able to say whatever you want, express how you feel however you want, and you know, be in control of, of your life and career. That's something that's just, so meaningful to me and I, I feel really happy that I'm in a position where I can have that. Hate to give the satisfaction asking how you're doing now. On Guts, Rodrigo goes full pop punk. Well, just so you know, most mortals don't have number one hits oh. flowing through their bodies <laughs> when they sit down at a piano. But I think Maybe. Vampire was that way a little bit too, wasn't it? Where you sat down at a piano and it just sort of yeah. happened? Yeah, I was getting ice cream with my friends and I was really upset about this thing that I wrote Vampire about. And I just had this burning desire to sit down at the piano and I'm sitting down at the piano and the chords just came and I was like, oh, Vampire, I don't know, it just popped into my head. I, I you know, hadn't really ever thought about writing a song like that. and. Uh, yeah, it just kind of came really naturally. So why is it so important to you, because this is true of all your songs, to not talk publicly about who or what exactly it's about? I think explanation is never good for <laughs> art. Why would I like pigeonhole a song into being about this one thing in my life when everyone has their own interpretation? It's the beauty of music. It just makes me feel less alone in my feelings. You know, when I write the song about some specific instance that where I felt this really strong way and then I look out into the crowd and I see some girl who felt the exact same way, it just makes me realize that, you know, we're all so much more alike than we are different and no one's ever really alone in their feelings. Is it still a trip to you to have that feeling, which is to say, to go out on a stage, a song you wrote maybe with one other person in the <laughs> privacy of a little room mm -hmm. and you feel like I, maybe someone will connect with this, to hear an entire arena or an entire stadium singing those words back to you? Yeah, I think it's a feeling that you never really get used to. I think songs are, are one of the most powerful mediums there are. You know, uh, you can write a song in 20 minutes and, you know, a, a huge crowd of 5,000 people could sing every word, you know? Uh, it's just, it's really powerful. There's a, there's a lot of responsibility in that, I think.
She has grown up during this whirlwind couple of years, but she's still having fun. The first album was very much about heartbreak, and I love that. That's what I needed to say at the time. I was very heartbroken. And I think this time around, I was just more thinking about the pressures of young adulthood and, you know, sort of the growing pains that um, come along with just turning 20. I, I wrote the album when I was 19 and 20, and uh, I think it also just takes itself a lot uh, less seriously, which I, I really enjoy. It's very playful and fun, and I just wanted to make songs that would be really cool to sing at a concert and jump around to, so I feel like that's what we tried to do. So you've said that the last couple of years you've grown up by a decade, much more <laughs> than the two years or so. Yeah. How much are you different today than you were when you were writing those songs for Sour? Oh my gosh, I'm a completely different person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote all those songs for Sour when I was 17 and I'm 20 now. And obviously my life has changed drastically, you know, my career and my environment, everything's so different. Um, but I just think all of that pales in comparison to how much you change as an individual from the ages of 17 to 20. Yeah. I feel like I learned so much about myself and who I wanted to be and the people that I wanted to surround myself with. And um, you sort of just, yeah, I have sort of this new confidence that I didn't have before. People have called you the voice of your generation. <laughs> They've said that you've sort of captured what it means to be your age or close to your age in this moment in time. Do you have any sense for what that means exactly? <laughs> no, oh my gosh, it's so, so crazy. That's such a, wow, that's a, that's a really big title. Because you're just telling your own story, yeah. but it just so happens to reflect what a lot of people are going through. All I can do is be myself, I think, and write songs that I like. And um, I think the fact that people gravitate towards them is amazing. Road to Country Stardom began in an unlikely place. I started in a bathroom, is where does that sound? She's doing songs and covers in a bathroom. From the bathroom to the biggest stages in music, Brown recently finished his sold out Drunk or Dreaming international tour. It's gotta feel good as an artist to be yeah. able to travel the world and fill up those arenas. You're not, we're not just talking about, you know, Atlanta and Chattanooga anymore. Yeah. Like, you're a global star. What does that feel like? I mean, dude, it feels amazing, um, especially, like, coming from where I came from, my background, getting to go to, you know, Australia. I never really left Georgia, so now I'm getting to travel the world to do music, and it makes absolutely no sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm thinking about is how I'm homesick. The son of a white mother and a black and Native American father, Brown was raised in Northwest Georgia and Southeastern Tennessee. His childhood was marked by periods of homelessness, abuse at the hands of a stepfather, and racism. Brown found stability with his grandmother and solace in music. Poverty, abuse, racism, all the things you encountered as a young man, how much does that childhood, which was difficult by your own admission, how does that inform your music? Do you still feel it when you're sitting to write a song? Um, not as much as I did when I first came in. And I still, I wanna go back to that. But I feel like I've told a lot of my story. And, and I have noticed like as 
I keep going and more of my story opens up, especially on stage. Like I, now it's, it's, it's went even further. And, and I feel like that's gonna happen. It's gonna lead to something else and, and maybe a documentary or a movie or something, which I think would be really cool. Where did it start for you? Where did you get that bug for, not, not necessarily I'm gonna grow up and be a, a, a star, but like, I just like singing, I like playing, I like listening to music. How did that start for you? Oh, uh, music was always my life. That was kind of my escape, even though I didn't realize it coming up to my childhood. It started coming out more when I started working at Lowe's. And in the meantime, like while I was mixing paint, I was singing. My buddy ended up hearing me and told me to try out for the talent show. So then when I tried out for the talent show, um, I got like an encore. And so then that was like kind of what sparked me wanting to sing. And then I just started posting it to Facebook. Did your uh, coworkers like that you were singing on the job? Yeah, yeah. He was like, "Man, you gave me cold chills," and I didn't know what to think about it. I was like, "Really?" And uh, that's you know that's what sparked everything. I'm very competitive, so then once you know people told me that they liked it, then I was like, "I wonder how many other people I can get to like it." And it started way back in third grade. In between shifts at Lowe's and later FedEx, Brown posted covers of country hits to Facebook. His rendition of Lee Bryce's I Don't Dance, recorded in the bathroom, exploded while he slept. Yeah, I was that kind of man. I remember waking up and my phone was completely black and put it on the charger and immediately once it turned on, I just got notifications for hours. I couldn't unlock my phone, I couldn't do anything, it just kept popping up. I remember it being 60,000 followers overnight. Wow. And I thought that was big. And then fast forward, and then I, I did a George Strait check, yes or no, and 60,000 turned into millions. And then that's when I started just writing my own music. <laughs> so what was it like the next day at work? Uh, well, this time, now I'm at FedEx. Okay, <laughs> so, okay, you moved on. And so I was, uh, coming in late to work, you know, I, I was taking multiple lunch breaks, going doing covers in my car, and my boss was cool with it, because uh, he liked to watch the numbers go up with me. We'd post it, and I'd be like, it would just immediately just flood my inbox. And so he would just sit there and watch it with me, thought it was the coolest thing, and uh, he wanted to see how far I could go. And I get a, a call saying that we need you to move to Nashville. He just told me, he's like, yeah, man, go, and then you can come back if you need to, so. It was a assurance thing for me. Brown moved to Music City to chase the dream. What were some of the reactions you heard from people in Nashville? No, I wouldn't say it was just Nashville. I'd say it was everywhere. I mean, was especially the internet. They'd be like, just look at him. He's not country. That's not what country looks like, yada, yada, yada. But I feel like it's also what made me blow up on Facebook. Because, I mean, I had a lot of people that they clicked my video and they're like, I thought you were going to rap. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started singing, so it kind of it shocked them, and then they wanted to share it. You say, what if I hurt you? Brown proved his doubters wrong, releasing a self-titled debut album in 2016, featuring his first number one song, What Ifs. What if I was made for you, and you were made for me? What if this is it? What if it's meant to be? And the nine times platinum smash, Heaven. I don't know. continues to defy country conventions. He has crossed over to the pop charts with hits like One Thing Right, a collaboration with DJ Marshmallow. How do you describe your sound? I think it kind of just evolves over time. When I first got into music, I was really scared of everything. I was like, well, if I do this wrong, if I do this wrong, and now it's just I get to be myself, and I wish I would have got to do that from the beginning, but it's hard, man. You, know, you, you, you want to be successful, and you feel like you got to play the, by the book and all this stuff. Um, but it, you know, I did, and it helped me get here, and now it helps me get to open up. Now, the other rumor about you is you're a good basketball player. I'm True? okay. What's your game like? I got to scout you real quick. Oh, uh, well, it's getting, I'm getting older, so it's getting a little slow. <laughs> Dude, if you're old, where do you see me out there? Hey, I don't know what it is. The other day I, I played at my house and it's been a couple months and uh, my lower back was hurting me for like four days. Mm. My shins hurt for like nine days. <laughs> I was popping Advil. I, I mean, I take Advil before I play now. 
So <laughs> that's just telling you. The preemptive Advil yeah. is the first step toward middle age yeah. basketball guy. What position did you play in high school? I played small forward, shot a lot of threes. I had to get in there and get some rebounds too. How about you? Uh, I was all over the place, yeah. Like, not center. So are you, is it true that you are the only artist ever to play every NBA arena on a tour? We were eating at lunch one day and they were like, would you want to play every NBA arena? I said, of course. Yeah. And you can make it happen. So yeah. they, my team made it happen. There hey, it is. Hey, I made it. There it is. I played sports my whole life, so when I get to do these things, it's just so memorable because I'll never play in the NBA. <laughs> but, you know, I got to play inside of the NBA arena. So. We've both come to terms with the fact we're not going to play in the NBA. No. Despite what you're seeing here today. If somebody wants to give us a look, you know? See what I mean? I just spot up, shoot now. That's it. I, hey, I see it. Oh. Got to leave on a made one. There he is. There we go. That's it. 100%. Still hasn't missed. Doing it his way, Brown is filling stadiums and making history. This summer, he became the first black artist ever to headline a concert at Boston's famed Fenway Park. When I started playing bigger places, I got like imposter syndrome. It moved too fast. I wasn't the greatest on stage. I wondered what everybody thought about me. I was so nervous to be on stage because I'm a very shy guy. Uh, but whenever I'm on stage, I'm the guy that I wish I was all the time. You're gonna be on a lot of stages singing it coming up on this new tour. I don't know how much you can say yet, but we're talking big venues yep. starting next year. We're doing six stadiums, uh, which I'm really excited about. When we did Fenway, I knew that I was supposed to be there. Mm. Fenway was very iconic to me. And when I got out there, you know, there was no nerves, there was no, Oh my God, it was like, it's showtime and I'm gonna, you know, put on a show and let these people know that I'm so glad they're here. Brown shared the stage that night with his wife, Caitlin, a singer herself. The couple has two young daughters and a number one hit. Thank God your hand fits perfectly in mine. Another cool element about your performance is performing with your wife, right? Yeah. Singing Thank God with your two beautiful little girls, maybe somewhere in the stadium. Yeah, they're it, asleep. <laughs> they're out. By the time you come on, they're done. Yeah. Uh, how cool is that, not only to perform with Caitlin, but also to have it become such a hit? Thank God. It was awesome. I knew it was gonna be a hit from the start, you know? Uh, we, we met through music, and once we found this song, we used to do covers and stuff and put it on YouTube, and so my fans knew that she sung, uh, but not the whole, you know, place, country world, whatever. And we found this song when we put it out. She was nervous. I was like, babe, this song's gonna be a smash. It don't even have to go to radio. Like, it's gonna be a smash because my fans have been waiting on it and you're amazing. But I remember when, before we went out on stage at Fenway, she was like, I'm gonna throw up. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm gonna throw up. I was like, just look at me. 
I'm right here. Everything's gonna be okay. And then she came out, she killed it, and then everybody lit their phones up and sang it back wow. to us. It's her first number one, and it was just amazing for her, and I was glad that I got to be a part of it. You don't know what the response always is gonna be, and mm -hmm. then to walk out at Fenway Park with your wife and have 35, 40,000 people singing every word back to you. What is that feeling like? Uh, I mean, it's the best feeling in the world, man. So that raises the question, will you and your wife now, because that was such a hit, is there gonna be more music from oh, the, the two of you? Yeah, Of course, yeah. We're actually working on it right now. Um, just finished my studio, so hopefully we get it a lot more. Maybe she'll jump on a ride too. She <laughs> says she's a little rusty, but... Um. <laughs> I bet she's all right. It's amazing to look at the charts, particularly this summer, but in general, and you've been right up at the top of them, how country has gone so mainstream and to see the top three or four songs not just in country but in all music be country it feels like you were part of a wave of a new generation of people who are taking country to a different place does it feel that way to you at all i just do my own thing and <laughs> i don't even you know look at that type of stuff um i just do my my music i just love that i can be all over the place and be myself and and not be worried about it and then people can come to my shows and still have fun only ones i keep around me is my fam no coincidence it's always been the plan do you stop and have moments and you go man it's a long way from here back to the facebook videos and the, the childhood i had i just don't think about it because i feel like you know everything that i went through is a part of my life that got me here and i'm actually proud of it you know a lot of it was tough and hard and you didn't know what was going to come out of it but I feel like that's who made me who I am today, it made me strong, it made me want to give back to people, it made me humble, and just made me proud of who I am and where I came from. treasure trove. Yeah, it's just all kinds of, this is fun stuff. I could get lost in this all day. This is the rehearsal space? This is the rehearsal now? space. Yeah. This is where, you know, we've pretty much got this set up as we would set up on our stage at a show. It's a, like a playhouse, I imagine, for a musician. You it's, come in here, guitars and drums and whatever else you yeah, need. Yeah, it's a candy store a little <laughs> bit. So, and it's, it's a place to put all that stuff, you know, and and have it out and, you know, oh, that and see what this does, you know. And then you might find a hit song, just grabbing things off the wall. Well, that's the I hope. You know, that's the hope. But also the hope is just that, you know, you get to make the, make the sounds that give the vibrations that make it feel like the right thing, you know. Baby, no one oh, finds those vibrations quite change. like Chris Stapleton. This might sound strange, but... On his latest album, the 45-year-old reaches back to his earliest days in Nashville, long before the world knew his name. The title track, Hire, is what year is it? It's 22 years old, 23 years old. And that's some, one of the, that was, song was on the first demo session I ever did when I moved to town as a songwriter. So I wrote that song by myself and, and it's been hanging around ever since. So, so that's 2001, you've yeah. just come to town, your first demo. Yeah. So that's been sitting there waiting to be something for a couple of decades. How do you decide when to pull that one off the shelf and put it in an album? Well, that one's pretty uh, high level of difficulty as far as uh, singing goes and um for me maybe not for some you're up else, there yeah some of those notes <laughs> and uh i don't know I, I think i was probably afraid of it for a long time and my wife was would always 
would always push for that song. And she was like, you should try that. And I was like, I don't, I don't know if I have it right now. I don't know if I have that one anymore, you know. Because like, I wrote it when I was 23, you know, like, and you get to be in your 40s. You're like, ah, oh, maybe I don't have what I used to have. <laughs> but I've been working with a really uh, great vocal coach named Rob Stevenson who has helped me really, you know, not only get back some of the things that I thought I didn't have anymore, but find some other other range that's well, really nice. So where we cut that song is about it's at least a step, maybe a step and a half higher than it was when I did the demo in oh, is that right? So wow. you know, it was a little bit of a you know, like a challenge to myself to try to do it, I think. So um and that one that one was, you know, a little bit of a battle to get, but we got it. You've got range with this thing that extends your range. Well it's <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, that's me on a good day. <laughs> Stapleton taking that one-of-a-kind voice even higher. Question I think I've never asked you or talked to you about is when you first realized your voice was special or different, was there a parent or a music teacher or somebody who said, because your voice is so distinctive. Well, my parents always told me I was special and different, as any good parent would, you know, but... Um, was it early in your life? Was it when you got to Nashville? When did people say, hmm, there's something different about him? I always sang, so that was always like one of one of my things that I would do. I think at some point, people only maybe regarded as special or something when you start to have some kind of notoriety with it, you know, mm -hmm. like, otherwise you're a dude that sings, you know, like, there's lots of people that can sing, you know. Well, the road rolls out like a welcome night. I don't know anybody who sings like you. In other words, the way that voice comes out of that beard well, that takes, is different. I think that that maybe takes... Uh, even when I moved to town, if you listen to things from when I moved to town, I'm not the same singer. You know, I spent a lot of time trying to be other people, you know, like, uh, I love Vince Gill. I've, I've, I've tried so hard to be Vince Gill and sound like Vince Gill. There's lots of, lots of recordings, of demo recordings of me, like, wishing I was Vince Gill or, you know. Um, but I'm not, I'm not any of those people. And, and eventually, you hopefully, through all those influences and um, also focusing on what it is that you do, uh, you find out what that is and then you put that out there and and that's if that's some something special that people think is special that's great stapleton found his voice for good in 2015 with his grammy winning debut solo album traveler in the eight years since he has earned eight grammys won 15 Country Music Association awards, and most recently was named the Academy of Country Music's Entertainer of the Year. In February, another milestone for Stapleton, when he was invited to stand alone on one of the world's biggest stages. What is the level of nervousness going into the Super Bowl uh, anthem? Terrified, exponentially beyond belief <laughs> but the national anthem is a hard one yeah for any singer i don't care who you are on a number of levels because you can be immortalized for really screwing it up or you can do a passable serviceable job and everybody's like all right cool he he got it right or you, you know hopefully you get something beyond that but just to get through it if you get through it there's there's this your shoulders drop and and you go okay i didn't screw any of that up I don't have to hear about it forever. I, I, you know, there's no, I didn't fall down or, you know, there, it, it's a, it's a lot of eyes on that song, and a lot of judgment on that song if you, if you get it wrong. So I might have worked on that more than I worked on anything <laughs> to do uh, for any television performance ever. But I was very nervous. I had a sinus infection that day, so I didn't do. I shot away from some things that I might have done mm. as a as a singer that day, but whoever, what well, really the power of that after I watched it and I didn't, I don't like to watch things back, but people are like, man, you should really go watch it. Go watch it. Whoever did all the edits with the coaches and the, yeah. the guys on the, on the ship and the, and, and the fly, the, it was a, it was a really brilliant bit of editing in my mind that really made it feel maybe more powerful than it would have, you know, with just me doing it. Were you aware afterward that the Eagles head coach had tears coming down his face, that Jason Kelsey was choked up, and that you had a role in that? 
yeah, I, you know, I, I was aware after people were like, oh, you made, you know, you're making people cry. I was like, oh, okay, good. I'm going to go watch the game. <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was you know, there's a lot of coming down off of something like that where you're just like, all right, I, I did it. I did it. I, I, I did that thing. And the whole of the Now the debate is Whitney Stapleton, the best Super Bowl anthem of all time. So well, I'll, I know you won't I'll weigh in on I'll that. I'll defer. <laughs> this is the chair that I have sat in for every record that we've made, but it it was in my parents' uh, little kitchenette. But I always have carried this chair with me. I moved to town with this chair, and so I sit in this chair anytime I'm um, making records and I'm, and I'm sitting down. Sometimes I'm standing up, but if I'm sitting down. In a, in a creative capacity, this is the chair. So, what's the significance of it to you? It's a comfortable chair. <laughs> <laughs> that, but, uh, so, that's where it ends. <laughs> well, that's the main part. As as I get older, but um, it uh, you know I like to have little things with you that that you carry with you through time, and I think those things inform what we do in ways that maybe you can't completely understand. But uh, if you have those little bits with you while mm. you're doing it, uh, whether it's a thing or a mentality or whatever it is. I think that that's good. I think that's a good thing. So that's, it's that's it's familiar. Story. It's home. It's so, familiar. It's home. Yeah. yeah. It feels so, comfortable. Stapleton also finds the comfort of home standing next to him on stage. Sing my share of broken halos. He and his talented wife, Morgan, who met as young songwriters and now share five children, write, produce, and perform together. Broken halos that used to shine. White Horse is the hit that's out right now, yeah. first single off the album. What is that song about exactly? And is it true that when you ran it by Morgan, as you do everything, she was like, I don't know. I don't well, know that's, that, yeah, that song's the, the, the reverse of higher. It's just like, I would bring that one up because <laughs> I like rock. I like guitar licks and stuff. That's, yeah. that's how I hear things. I, I don't think of songs as lyrical things, or uh, I, I, it takes me so long to hear lyrics in a song. I, I want to hear all the other stuff first. I'll listen to everything in a song, mm. maybe ten times before I even hear what somebody's saying. And if all that stuff feels good to me, then I'll start paying attention to what the lyrics are. So, I think of songs in the reverse of most, uh, maybe songwriters, but maybe people in general. I don't know, but I think those things are important to me more than. Yeah. Uh, lyrics are even but I always liked that groove and, and uh, me and Dan Wilson wrote that song and uh, yeah I always just wanted it we played it we used to play it out live a long time ago uh, pre pre traveler and it just kind of crept back up I said well maybe we can try it again and if we hook it may, maybe you'll be okay with it <laughs> and I, I think she she liked it after we, we got it I so. think what I'm hearing so far Chris is Morgan gets approval on these songs oh of course yeah or at least discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'd be like, hey, just let me have this one thing, you know, like. Well, she's got good taste. Oh, yeah, great. So, and everything but men, that's what I like to say. <laughs> I don't know, I think she did all right.
When you said Higher was uh, written in 2001 for, for a demo, and that's the title track on this album, does that give you a moment of pause to look back at the last 22 years and to think, my gosh, I came to Nashville hoping some of this would maybe happen, and it's so far exceeded my dreams? Is it a marker for you? Certainly there's always moments to reflect, and I've talked about, uh, I think, a lot of times in interviews, how songs but gain meaning over time, or the meanings change over time. And so I don't know exactly how that's going to hit me when I hear it out in the world or see how people respond to it. I think I'll have different feelings. That's when the songs get meaning to me, is when people assign the meaning to them. You know, I can think a song means one thing, and I can write it, and I can sing it, and then it goes out into the world, or you see people singing it back, and you see that it means something to them that's probably not what you intended, mm. or maybe it's exactly what you intended, but it, you see it in real time. It's gotta be something when a stadium full of people sings any song that you sat in a room and wrote, and they love it so much and it means so much that they know all the words. It doesn't get old. It's, it's a really humbling and addictive experience, you know, at the same time. You know, you, when you hear that, it's a, it's a buzz, you know, to, to hear that. On a Nashville ride from struggling songwriter to music icon, Stapleton still prefers to let his songs be the stars. I don't do this for the fame part. It's that I was never, that's not a thing I like to chase. I'm in it for the music part, mainly, and the fun part, you know. And we're well beyond that, that you know, that's how I make a living. But um, that's, uh, yeah, that's what I'm in it for. Okay, this is our conference room. Believe it or not, this was my dining table. Is that true? <laughs> it is true. You really are a scrappy organization. Scarlett Johansson has been scrappy from the start. On screen. <laughs> and now in business, with the launch of her skincare line, The Outset. I want to talk about The Outset a lot. <laughs> I'm here for the eye cream. Great. The Colin Jost eye cream, yeah, as I understand it. <laughs> That's how it's commonly known as, yeah. <laughs> but let's start, if we can, with Asteroid City. Sure. Which is an amazing Wes Anderson film. Beautiful to look at, as all of his stuff is. My word, it's hot. Johansson plays Midge Campbell, a 1950s movie star forced to quarantine in the fictional desert town of Asteroid City. You were very good in the one about the tramp in the brothel Thank who you. gets amnesia and Thank becomes you. a pediatrician. You were very Actually, authentic. Actually, maybe my favorite character ever. I don't know why nobody else liked it. Oh. So what is that phone call like when Wes says, not only do I want you in the movie, but I wrote a part for you? It's like a career dream goal, um, definitely. I was very excited to read a script in its entirety of his, which I never had the chance to do. And... It was in the middle of COVID, the, right in the middle of COVID. So I was not expecting to get any calls about work. I'd sort of, you know, just kind of had taken a bit of a pause, I guess. It was a, it was a, it was a time that felt all over the place. And so I, yeah, I, I read the script and I, I play a few different characters in this film. So I play an actor who's playing an actor who's also preparing a play. Um, so it has, it's, 
there was a lot to discuss. I had to wrap my head around. I don't like the way that guy looked at us. The alien. Well, how did he? How did he look? Like at we're us? doomed. Maybe we are. As with every Wes Anderson movie, there may be no point exactly into asking what it's about, because it's kind of an experience. But how do you describe this film to people who are thinking about going to see it? The film is really a sort of exploration in existentialism. It's, I think, a film that's made, it's very reflective of where Wes is at, I think, in his life and career. You know, the, the fact that it was written and developed during the quarantine time um, is definitely baked in there. Um, it's very self-reflective. And I think it's also a celebration of creativity and the nomadic circus that actors create around themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is something that I think it comes up in Wes's work a lot, that real fondness and celebration of that environment. So how do you describe the Wes Anderson experience? It's so cool to look at, obviously, and fun to watch. All of his films are. But on the other side of it, as an actor, what does that mean? How is it different from other things you've done? Well, I, I think Wes's love of that nomadic circus is really, you know, a, it's also represented in, how, in the environment that he creates on set. We were very isolated um, in a town called Chinchon, which is in Spain in an agricultural area, you know, really l never left our, our compound um, where we were all staying. And this whole world was created on a watermelon farm. Um, so all the earth and all the all the mountains and everything were brought in and built this practical set in the middle of nothing and you know just agricultural land and so it just it was very surreal but also so magical i mean you would it was so unique i've never experienced i mean i'd say doing theater is maybe the closest thing that i would could describe it to liken it to it was it was it's such a beautiful family that he that he surrounds himself with of of you know family he chooses so let's talk about midge specifically mm -hmm. You read her on the page. Did you get her right away? What did you think about the character? I, I actually had to read it a couple of times. Um, my character, Midge, is a, she is a, you know, movie star. Um, she is beloved. She is kind of narcissistic and self-involved um, in, a, I think, a way that's kind of, it, that's, very um, alluring and enigmatic. And um, she's aware that she's constantly being watched. You know, that's just an ingredient in her life that's always there. And, and she doesn't mind that at all. And she's, you know, I, we looked at just what actors I could kind of hang my hat on and, um, you know, of that era whose career could we emulate. And um, I think Betty Davis was yeah. who we both liked. And I just, love her I love her whole spirit and 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 her vulnerability her strength her groundedness like she feels to me you know very authentic and um and so that's who we kind of base her on so yeah. th this role came to you at a complicated time for you as well <laughs> to say the least it wasn't it, well it wasn't initially that complicated <laughs> initially it was wide open and great but as we waited for the window of time to shoot because of covid and all the regulations um you know i i, I got pregnant um and i was very happy to be pregnant but i i knew that you know i had this obligation to shoot this film and, and uh, nonetheless, I at some point had to tell Wes that I was pregnant because I thought, I, you know, I guess this couldn't, maybe isn't gonna push for as long as I need it to. And um, in, in true Wes fashion, he was so excited that I was pregnant. He said, how long do you think you're gonna need <laughs> post, you know, post birth? And I said, I don't know, maybe like, I guess eight weeks or something. So on my eight week <laughs> postpartum date, I was flying to Spain and with my young, you know, eight week old baby and Colin. And um, so that was another wow. added piece to the experience that was so, it was wonderful. I mean, it was so wonderful. It was, it was challenging, but it was also 
completely unexpected. And, you know, I felt so fortunate and grateful to be able to, to still be able to participate, you know, and then I got to bring my infant baby to the table and he could be held by Adrian Brody and Willem Dafoe and <laughs> Brian Cranston and everybody else. So. The stories he will have, his earliest <laughs> babysitters, all Academy Award winners. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Johansson's own story begins in New York's Greenwich Village, where she grew up with dreams of starring in the Broadway musicals she saw with her mother. She began to audition and landed her first film role at just nine years old in Rob Reiner's North. After working steadily as a child actress, Johansson was thrust into adult stardom by her performance alongside Bill Murray in the acclaimed 2003 movie, Lost in Translation. I just don't know what I'm supposed to be. I forgot how young you were when you made that. I mean, 17, you're just, you're a high school kid, basically yeah. being thrust into this world. Was that a hard thing to have the, that many eyes on you and to be treated now as an adult effectively after that movie? I mean, I think just being that age is hard anyway. I felt like I was at a crossroads at that time because I, you know, Lost in Translation had come out and Girl with a Pearl Earring and I did some very exciting work, but then I felt like the work that was out there for me anyway was not it just it was sort of uninspired and I didn't know, I thought, oh, I can't, I don't want to do work that's uninspiring. I would rather do another, some other thing. She found the fire again on Broadway, starring and winning a Tony Award in the 2010 revival of A View from the Bridge. Which sort of brings it full circle, the song and dance and the performance in your living room with your family. Yeah. Not only to come to Broadway and do Arthur Miller, but to win a Tony Award. That must have been thrilling. It was thrilling. Our production was so incredibly received and feel totally welcomed by this amazing community I admired for my entire life and feel that thrill of being on stage every night and the unexpected, you know, have that, oh, it just, it's so exciting and makes you feel like alive, you know? And then it's the same year, I think it's the same year as the play that um, Black Widow and Iron Man 2 come along, right? Right. By a twist of fate, all of a sudden, now you're in the Marvel Universe. So yeah. you're at this crossroads where you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> to winning a Tony, and now you're in a Marvel movie, and then a bunch that came after that. Right. What did the Marvel movies do to your career and your life, just in terms of like joining this world that people are so invested in and so many people are aware of and watch it? Yeah. How much fun was that to be a part of? I didn't know whether... I would be accepted by the, you know, by the this massive fan base that was already there. It was so early days in that genre. I mean, the way that it was then, it was just the beginning. I mean, we were on the set of Avengers going, this is either going to be, we're having an amazing time with all these incredible actors and yet we don't know, you know, this could be right. really <laughs> awful. I mean, it's so crazy you have, I remember going, there's a Nordic god, we have a mutant, this like rich playboy turned robot guy. I'm a Russian spy. It was just like, this is a recipe for disaster. Somebody that's been frozen in ice and comes up. It's like, but then here we are.
So this is home. Yeah, that's the home away from home. When Johansson is not on set, she's here in the offices of The Outset, the skincare company she co-founded just over a year ago. This is our like best selling okay. sort of trio. It's our cleanser, our prep serum, and our daily moisturizer. I'm just realizing I don't do enough. I have no yeah. night creams. What? I don't have. No. But you're on camera all the I time. I know. I know. I need to get more serious about my career. Well, I know. <laughs> So what compelled you to take on this challenge? Since I was probably 12, 13 years old, have struggled with acne. And when I was younger, it was all about sort of stripping away your skin and, you know, basically resurface your entire face. <laughs> right. And at some point I, you know, it was like, I have to kind of just stop everything and just try something else, which was just using very clean, moisturizing products and stop like stripping everything away. And that's when my skin completely transformed. Mm. So is it true that um, Colin is a big proponent of the eye cream? Yes. It, that's his thing? Colin was our eye cream mm -hmm. connoisseur. I never used eye cream before and <laughs> Colin uses it every day. And so I thought, well, why don't, since, you know, it was during COVID and I didn't have so many people to test it on in my, <laughs> Colin became our, our eye cream expert. Wow. And um, I got him to switch to the outset eye cream. So. And he looks great. He's never looked better. <laughs> so youthful. He is. He's like de-aging. It's very annoying. Look at you. You're doing it all. And with a toddler at home. I mean, it's all very impressive. I mean, I'm sure I left like the <laughs> oven on or whatever. But, yeah. Welcome to Boost. One thing we love to see, women supporting women. So today we're celebrating sisterhood in all of its glory, from the sisters you were born with to the sisters you choose. And we're starting off with the 40 plus double dutch club where women are helping each other maximize their physical and mental health. No kids. No pets. And no stress. That's part of the motto of the 40 Plus Double Dutch Club, a group of women over 40 gathering weekly to jump rope. Where's she at? Where's she go? What is the 40 Plus Double Dutch Club? Sisterhood. Most of us came for the Double Dutch and having fun with our friends, we stay for the sisterhood because that's what it's become. Pamela Robinson and Katrina Dyer Taylor founded the group on the south side of Chicago in 2016 when Pam was going through a tough time. I felt like I was sinking. My marriage was coming to an end. My kids were growing up. They didn't need me the same way they had. I just needed to find something that was for me. After jumping double dutch at a Memorial Day barbecue, she felt something shift. It made me forget about everything that was going wrong in my life. I felt like a kid again. And that was the feeling I needed to rediscover. <laughs> then I went to Katrina's the next day and told her. What was your response? Because I knew exactly what Pamela was going through at the time. Whatever it is, I'm there. What began as seven women in a parking lot has grown into a sisterhood of nearly 200,000 with clubs in over 100 cities in the US and abroad. We caught up with them at a meetup. Women from all walks of life displaying their ages proudly. What's your day like? What's finding self-care and support. I'm kind of a caregiver for a couple of people, and so I needed something to take care of myself. I just 
just trying to learn how to do life yeah. as a mom, as a wife. I was unemployed as well. And it was just a really dark time. Miss Shirley had never jumped double dutch before. How does it feel to be out here jumping rope at 87 years old? It feels great. And they said I inspired them, but they're keeping me young. As a first timer, I have to admit, I was a little nervous to jump in. Because y'all are real skilled, but <laughs> if you don't get this, I owe the whole crew dinner. But after some encouragement from the ladies, okay, what do I need to do? I was ready. Keep doing that. Keep going. Keep going. Their movement has become about more than just jumping rope. <laughs> From their No Sister Left Behind Fund, which provides financial assistance to members in need, to community service for those who are in shelters and incarcerated. What impact do you think this is having? It's helping women not only to improve our physical health, but also our mental and our spiritual health as well. We have women that are dealing with grief, loss, depression. We know it's not just about jumping rope. It's really about saving lives. And it shows them that you're not alone. You're not the only one that's going through this. You have somebody. You have a whole sisterhood now. A sisterhood. think makes this sisterhood so strong? Good for all of us. The love that we all have, the genuineness, the authenticity of this group. It's really the love and the fellowship. We are women who are not competing with each other. We're getting together to uplift each other, to encourage each other, to inspire each other to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. Party class, apple class, party class. Dylan Dreyer stumbled upon a group of women who are bonding one step at a time. And when they go on a walk, you cannot miss them. Let's meet the city girls who walk. If you would have told me 250 people would come to a walk in New York City, I would have never believed you. <laughs> Every walk is a good walk for Brianna Cohn. It's one thing to go for a walk or go for a walk with friends, but you turned this into something huge. I was feeling a little lonely, a little isolated, and I was like, what if I posted on my TikTok? What if we did a walk club where we just like drink our coffee, we chit chat, we leave our worries behind. The 28 year old fitness trainer who had already amassed millions of followers across TikTok and Instagram asked her community if they would join her for a walk around New York City's Pier 45. People were like, oh my God, I want to join. This sounds amazing. Like, People were sending it to their friends, and I was not expecting that. I was expecting like 10, 20 people. On her first group walk back in March of this year, more than 100 women showed up for a stroll, and City Girls Who Walk was born. How would you describe a perfect walk? You listen to that feel-good music, and you just get lost, lost outside, lost in the time, and just a quick like 30, 30 minute walk, that's all you need. Brianna didn't want the walking group to be a huge commitment. The plan was once a week for a 40 minute walk. That's it. Some girls like go to brunch after, some just hang out and chat. What is it about walking with others? When you're walking by yourself, I feel like so many thoughts come into your head, but if you walk with someone else, you can kind of forget all of that and just talk about life and just like feel that connection. The event blew up on social media with hundreds of women showing up week after week forming a sisterhood in the process. So who goes on these walks? Who's walking together? It ranges, not kidding, from like 18 to 65, 70. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Soon, women in other cities like Philadelphia, Boise, and Phoenix were creating their own branches of city girls who walk. What's some of the most meaningful feedback you've received from this? I actually pulled up one of my favorite quotes that somebody said to me. They said, City Girls Who Walk has changed my life. It is so, so much richer and more full of love with dear new friends in a season when I really, really needed them. I can't thank you enough. How so does that make you feel? It's, it honestly, like, it could bring me to tears. Like, it's helped so many girls, and that's exactly why I started it. 
The future is bright for Brianna. She started weekly picnics for city girls who don't feel like walking and is hoping to expand to group fitness classes as well. What advice would you have for folks at home watching this who just kind of need that extra push to get off the couch and to just get outside? I would love every single person to come. Just take that first step. Just like get off the couch, come. You don't have no idea like who's going to be there, who you're going to meet. It could be your best friend for like your life. We're back here on The Boost with a truly unique sisterhood. Okay, there's an apartment complex in the suburbs of Chicago where women from different generations are forming lifelong friendships. Take a look. <laughs> Jennifer Rossner is proof that age is just a number. The Rat Pack was, was the music I listened to in high school. No one else did, but that's what I was blasting on my radio. Sinatra, I met Tony Bennett. That was like probably the, the high point of my life. Growing up an only child, this millennial found herself surrounded by some slightly senior sidekicks. I was always with my parents all the time and my grandparents and my aunts. I was always kind of dragged along to adult activities and so I grew up fairly fast. When the pandemic hit, Jennifer left the bustling city life of Chicago to move back in with her parents in the suburbs. I actually didn't think it was possible to be closer to them. So I'm single if anyone's um, listening. And I realized that I probably won't increase my chances of meeting anybody by living with my parents at 35, 36 years old. So she made her way here, just blocks from her parents in an apartment complex full of mainly older, semi-retired folks. I had no expectation of what I would find once I got here. The general range is, is probably 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then there's me in my 30s. She started to feel at home after attending a happy hour held by the building's unofficial mayor. What I found in the happy hours is it attracted people from all ages and all segments of our world that we live in around here. We just began to really enjoy each other's company. It wasn't long before they became a close-knit crew, celebrating birthdays, holidays, taking dance lessons, and eating out a lot. I don't know that I've ever had like a, like someone there for every single thing that I possibly need them for outside of like my parents. And at any point in time, I have someone to do something with, which is a total novelty. This is like true companionate love. We truly have a sisterhood here. And if you had told me that in my 50s, I'd be making friends that I'm going to have forever, I would have said no way. I call it fancy dormitory living. We walk, we talk about boys. I'm not dead yet, so I love talking about guys and boys. Moments spent with this community bring back fond memories of Jennifer's late grandmother, Mae Molly. She had this really cool group of girlfriends and they would play Mahjong every Wednesday and she'd go out to dinner with my grandpa on Fridays and Saturdays. And so when I met these girls in this building, I was really struck by each one of them kind of has a quality of her. So I almost kind of found her in all of them. While she found a family in these ladies, they found the same with her. 
She's very close to her mom, and my daughter was, and I'm gonna start crying now, my daughter and I were always close, and you know, she's in New York now. You know, she's kind of pulled me into that, not because of my age or anything, but just because of family. And instead of playing Mahjong like her grandmother did, the squad gets together for a game of Rummy Cube every night. No one is aligned on what the rules really are. How many did you take again? Well, how are we playing? Oh, here we go. Oh. Okay, we're at this morning. There have been some um, fairly heated moments where someone has said to take a walk. Oh, there she is. No, you don't like <laughs> But all in good fun. A sisterhood created in the unlikeliest of places. I think we have to really think about intrinsic human qualities, what makes us all the same, and lean into that stuff. And everything else around it is crap. And, and just find the things that are relatable. And if you do that, anyone can become a friend. Now to students building confidence and creating their own lifelong sisterhood through rock climbing. Let's see how they help each other reach the top. Here's Chanel Jones. Rock climbing takes you out of your comfort zone and it like strengthens you in ways that you didn't know was possible. Every month, a special group of students and mentors meet here at this rock climbing gym in Queens. You gotta get it! Yeah! <laughs> nice footwork. Nice. nice. They're here to climb, of course, but the skills they gain and the goals they set go far beyond reaching the top of the wall. Okay, so show of hands, how many of you before this program um, had been rock climbing before? That would be none of you. <laughs> Emanuela, Deanna, and Marjana are just a few of the 30 climbers who are part of Young Women Who Crush. <laughs> it's a rock climbing and leadership development program empowering girls in high school and gender expansive youth in New York City. So what made you decide to give this a try? The free membership. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it. And now I can't stop doing it. The first climbing session, I basically only went up like two feet probably. And then I was screaming and like shaking and all that. But everyone was so supportive and then like making sure like you're safe and all that. I thought that this community is something so, so special for me. The program was co-founded in 2017 by Alexis Krauss, Eva Kalea, and Emily Varisco, all climbers who are aiming to change the landscape and accessibility of the sport. For the first time you got these girls together, did you realize that you were onto something? There was a spark in the air. There was so much love and support and investment in each other, and we just wanted to keep it going. Emily, I know you've been a coach for years. Why is a program like this needed? I just really wanted to create a space where young women could feel comfortable and not like they were being watched or judged. Climbing has changed my life and so to just share that and have built this community with all of them that's just become so much bigger than anything that even Emily and I could have ever imagined. Now it's in its fourth year the students, some of whom are first-generation Americans and immigrants, are guided by mentors, helping them build strength and confidence, both physically and mentally. Okay, you gotta start somewhere. Go start somewhere, okay, that's true. Yeah! It's a place that 23-year-old returning member, Marjana, credits for creating pathways and opportunities for her. When I went to college, I was the only person of color in the climbing team, and person wearing hijab, and Muslim, and women. So, You're just trailblazing yeah, all yeah. <laughs> Although it was intimidating at times, mm -hmm. it felt like I also deserve to be here. And then at the end of my college years, I actually led the climbing team at my school. One of the things that I think has been most surprising to me through the program is just the way that the kids have grown and the way that we see them being leaders in their own community. Climb on. It was support that I certainly felt nice. when the young climbers showed me the ropes. You make it look so easy. So strong. Fun. Fun. That. that was fun. The eight month long program culminates in an outdoor trip to upstate New York. And for the first time ever in the group's history, this year's climb was led by a team of women and non binary rock guides, a field that's historically been dominated by men. It's just been this really huge moment for us to like pause and look around the crag and be like, 
this is us. Like, we built this. It's so interesting because already I feel a sisterhood with you guys. It's kind of like a second family. You can come to a session having like the worst day of your life. And as soon as you see someone's face from here, it just like lightens you up. We're so present with like being happy with like a group of people who just want to see you do good. Stop. Welcome back to The Boost. Our very own Jenna Bush Hager has often shared with us the special bond she has with her twin sister, Barbara. And the two have a new children's book hitting the shelves. It's called Love Comes First, a true display of the importance of sibling support. My grandmother's life was defined by love. And what I admired most about her is that her love was limitless. She spread her light everywhere she went. You are a beautiful girl. She cherished her many visits to the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital in Portland, Maine. That is wonderful. Which was named in her honor in 1998. We haven't had her in our lives in five years. And so to be reminded of her just in the little things around this place always makes us feel pretty good. Three years after we lost our precious Ganny, a twist of fate. My sister unexpectedly gave birth to her daughter, Cora Georgia, in this very hospital. I lived in New York and happened to be in Maine for the weekend, and I woke up in the middle of the night in labor in Kenny Bunkport, and my husband Googled hospitals near me, and because she was six weeks early, she needed to be in the NICU, and that is when I first realized that Barbara Bush Children's Hospital existed. I went to visit her in the NICU, it's gonna make me cry, <laughs> and looked on the wall, and it said, Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. So it just felt very divine that she was born here and she got an excellent care. It was as if somebody was looking down. <laughs> For the first time since that remarkable day, my sister and I returned to the pediatric unit to see how kids today are living by our grandmother's example. Sisters, Sisters forever. forever! Sisters forever! Meet Juliana and Eliza Empey. Four years ago, they started a nonprofit called Splatters for Kids. They sell handmade greeting cards to raise money for the children's hospital. The girls were inspired by their 92 year old neighbor, Richard Troop, a longtime hospital volunteer. He's been volunteering for over 15 years, so we wanted to do something because he inspired us to help others too. We first chose cards because we always send cards to our great grandma and we know that it makes her happy when we send them. You know what, our grandmother, she loved writing letters to us. Do you guys like writing letters? Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like it spreads joy? 
Yeah. yeah. While encouraging others to spread joy, Juliana and Eliza raised nearly $15,000. Do you guys have a goal? What's your goal? $50 million. Whoa. $50 million? Some people think kids can't do big things. What do you say? We're kids and we're here, so we can yeah. do big things. <laughs> We were inspired to create our own cards with kids gathered at the hospital. Is it okay if I draw on yellow? Yeah. Do you want a yellow envelope because you like yellow? And write messages to people we love. Is that for your brother? Yeah. Willow and Emery made cards for their new baby brother, Easton, who they met the day before our visit for the very first time. There he is. Say hi. Say hi. He's so cute. Isn't he cute? Yeah. Is your brother your greatest dream come true? Yeah. Signed and sealed, it was time to deliver. Okay, should we go? Ready? Let's do, do it. it. Oh, hello, Hi. guys. Hi, girls. Hi. Welcome to the world, baby Easton. Thank you. Thank what you. were y'all gonna say? We love you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. Thank you. We gave much. our cards to doctors and nurses. Thank you for saving my life. You are the best doctor ever. Thank you for making Riker safe. Oh, thank you, honey. You're welcome. To new friends. Emmett, you inspire me. I hope you're feeling good. And to Mr. Troub, a devoted volunteer and role model for us all. Isn't that wonderful? Dear Mr. Troub, thank you for inspiring us to help others. We are so glad that you're our neighbor. Thank you so much. And I'm so proud of you, too. Thank you. For all you've done. You two have been such an inspiration. So are you. Our hearts were full on a day that love truly did come first. Now from our vault, let's throw back to Jenna and Barbara's first memoir, Sisters First. The duo shared stories from their childhood, once again showcasing a unique bond. Take a look. From the moment I was born, I had this person who lifted me up. Barbara has a huge heart. She was the type of kid that looked after everybody else in our class and wanted to make sure that everybody was taken care of. She's gentle, she's creative, she's a great artist, and she's brilliant. Jenna is extremely fun. She makes the most out of everything. She's always been an entertainer. She has a huge imagination and has loved making people laugh and smile and entertaining them. She makes the most out of any situation, so she's made my life extremely fun, and she's very loving. Thanks, Sissy. So many people think they know us because of years of sort of media spotlight or articles written about us, but really we felt like the true essence of who we were or are isn't really out there, and so we wanted to um, write our own story. We realized how lucky we have been. Uh, we've had sort of an extremely incredible life and always have had a partner to go through it with because we're twins. We were always encouraged to be very different. And we were nourished to do different things. I think we were always gonna have different careers. I attended the launch of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief when I was in my junior summer. And at the time, if you were living on the continent of Africa, you couldn't get access to antiretroviral drugs, which are the drugs that keep you alive when you are HIV positive. And so I was both angered by the inequity of that, but then inspired by seeing so many people stepping up. Sissy, welcome to my office. And this is where you work, I like it. I started Global Health Corps in 2009, and now we've worked with almost 1,000 incredible young leaders. Before I was working on policy for the U.S. government. I'm a communications and advocacy associate. And I work on a variety of issues, environment, labor. I'm so proud of Barbara, and it's important work. She works tirelessly. She's out traveling all the time. I feel how she's making the world a better place. And I got to experience a small part of what it's like to train to be an astronaut. She's always loved people. She's loved telling their stories. She's loved entertaining. And so it is a natural fit for her in every way, and she's great at it. Oh, she wants it. She wants it. Yes, yeah, she does. Yes, yeah, she does. When Jenna was pregnant with Poppy, we would say to Mila all the time, we're sisters, we're sisters, and we wanted her to realize 
because we realized how lucky we have been to have someone by our side and have someone that's had our back through our whole lives. She's one of the most important people in my life and she's witnessed all of these milestones. Um, makes me want to cry, I don't know why. <laughs> it's like our life expanded because of each other and I hope Poppy and Mila have that as well. I think a sister can be a blood sister like I so luckily have, but it can also just be a woman that has your back, that makes you feel like you're good enough, that empowers you to be your best person, to be your best self, that laughs at you, that cries with you. Um, and I had that in a blood sister. Whether it's your, your blood sister or a friend that's a sister, it's someone that will share your life with you, the good and the bad, and be alongside you as you go through life. After the break, we have an uplifting story you do not want to miss. Stay with us. back here on the boost with one last feel-good story for you. Check it out. A high school junior with special needs brought down the house last week during their first intramural, intramural basketball game of the season. Take a look at what happened in the final seconds of the game. <coughs> that right there, T. Ramirez, the buzzer beater from almost half court, wow. the crowd goes wild. The game was in Peoria, Arizona. It allows kids with disabilities and general education students to play together in activities like basketball. After the game, Ramirez was asked about the moment, called it amazing, it which so it was. Thank you so much for joining us. We love shining a light on the power of sisterhood, and we hope you feel encouraged to honor the fierce female bonds in your own lives. We'll see you back here tomorrow, right here on Today All Day. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Start Today. Now, I got to tell you, there's nothing like the beginning of a fresh new year. Whether you're a seasoned member or you're just joining us for the first time, there is a place for everybody in our Start Today community. We've got over a half million members. Come on! Never too late to join in. Scan the QR code to subscribe to our newsletter and get the jump start to improve your health. And what better way to kick off the new year than highlighting some of our community members. On this special episode, we're going to introduce you to four folks who have made huge strides in their fitness journey. So let's get to it. This is Start Today. First up, we're going to begin with Emily Baker. A few years ago, she took control of her health and she started running for 15 seconds at a time. Those 15 seconds eventually turned into 26.2 miles when she completed the New York City Marathon in 2022. Hoda and Jenna heard about Emily's story from our Start Today group and helped her celebrate her milestone with a style makeover. Now, before we see Emily's transformation, let's hear her story. I am Emily Conley Baker. I am 34 years old and I am a mother of three, a health and wellness coach, and I'm a registered pediatric nurse. 
I've always been someone who put on this face every day that I had everything together, but inside I really struggled emotionally, specifically surrounding my weight and my physical appearance. In 2019, I had my youngest. About three weeks later, my father passed away visiting us. His size was a massive comorbidity of his, and ultimately it didn't allow him to effectively get the care he needed. So witnessing that tremendous loss really just sat with me. I was on the phone with my two brothers, and my brother said to me, Emily, I know you don't feel like physically you're at rock bottom, but emotionally, I think you're there. I'm so thankful they said that to me because I, for the first time, recognized that rock bottom didn't have to be about what I looked like physically. In May of 2021, Emily underwent a vertical sleeve gastrectomy. I knew that it was like my one shot to get this right. And for my 33rd birthday, I decided I was gonna run 3.3 miles. I would start running 15 seconds at a time. Started just building up little by little by little. Emily joined a running club and became part of the Start Today community. I like couldn't get enough of it because it was just people exactly like me. It kind of lights a spark within you and you have this moment of like, wow, they've made themselves and their movement a priority today. I want to go and do that for myself. The Queens, New York resident ran a half marathon in March of 2022 and just nine months later completed the New York City Marathon. She is now a certified run instructor, a certified personal trainer, and has lost 135 pounds to date. I couldn't have done any of this alone without my family and without the community that I created as well. When I think about all of this change, I think about my children. I have a nine-year-old. I don't think she recognizes how much of a driving force she's been for me. I'm very proud of how far I've come on the inside, emotionally, physically, but I want to portray that with my style. Emily, so nice to meet you. Interstyle so expert, so Melissa talk. Garcia. So tell me a little bit about what your personal style is currently right now. I struggle in the style department. I'm either in my nursing scrubs or I am in active wear. At the end of this, how do you want to walk out and feel? I feel so much pride and confidence in my ability to change drastically. So I want people to see that in, in what I'm wearing. I am so excited. Let's get started and start trying some clothes on. Oh, wow. Yes. When she found the winning look, it was off to the salon. Welcome to LW Salon. Uh, thank you. They're gonna make you over so it's minimum, but still fabulous. Okay, we took some inches off your hair. Now it's time to get to work. Are you ready for your new look? I am. Okay, let's go. And we are uh, so let's go, let's go. Lucky because we are joined by Emily's family, her husband Nick, her kids Adeline, Flynn, and Cora and her running coach, Michelle Ray. What a beautiful mom you guys have. What an amazing wife. Um, are you guys anxious to see her? Yes. Are you sure? Are y'all excited? <laughs> okay, because she looked great before. I can't imagine how cool she's gonna I look know. now. Okay, so should we look at Emily's before picture? Okay. And can we see Emily's new look? Come on out, Emily! <laughs> wow! Oh my gosh, I, Melissa, this dress. Ridiculous, right? <laughs> and your husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, Melissa, why, why'd you choose it? Okay, so oh, first of all, it was such an honor to work with you, Emily. Oh. Like I had, you were, you were a blessing to me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we talked and she said she wanted to feel confident. She wanted her mind to catch up with her body. She said she didn't feel like they were together in yeah. sync. So we took something that was totally outside of her comfort zone. Mm -hmm. This was actually the first dress she tried on. This is by Karen Millen, only $84, which is amazing. And it just does so much for her figure and it's so many things she would have never worn. She said she didn't want to show her arms. She <laughs> thought she never could wear anything sleeveless. It's that's cutouts and she looks stunning. Gorgeous, yes. guys. Yes. What do you think? 
Addie, like, what do you I think? love it. Oh, <laughs> you look, by the way, you look so beautiful. Yes. I mean, inside out, the hair. Oh my God. It's, it's so on a lob. I love it. Yes. So Leona killed her hair. She did such a beautiful job. And Gia Makeup gave her a beautiful, natural, glowy look today. And it just all came together so beautifully. You look, how do you feel? Ugh. I just feel like so beautiful, like inside and out. And it's just like, I just feel very blessed. Mm, blessed well. for the opportunity. And then just, I can't even, it's, I struggle to put it into words because it's very overwhelming. Like when you, when your outside catches up with your inside. Yes. Wow. You are a way, true so well beauty. Said. You're well inspiring said. so many people, including your own family. Yeah. Look, um, we've got some flowers. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> That's from your husband. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he purchased those. Um, Emily, um, we think you deserve to do a little more shopping. Yeah. So we are sending you home with a $500 gift card to spruce up <laughs> to your spruce wardrobe. Up wow. So maybe Melissa can help you. I know there were, you. first of all, you looked amazing in every dress you tried we on. We didn't ask your husband. What do you think of your beautiful wife? I think she looks, looks amazing. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Up next, another star today member revealing his new mindset after he committed to a better lifestyle. Later, one woman is going to share her fitness journey and the importance of non-scale victories. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This next community member can walk for miles. Six years ago, Nick Bricker's first 10 minute walk felt like a triathlon to him, but now he walks about 12 miles a day. Now that's impressive enough, but he's also lost over 200 pounds and has completely changed his lifestyle. Last summer, Nick stopped by the third hour to talk about his journey. When I became a father at age 40, I was heavy and only getting heavier. I was drinking 10,000 calories of beer a day and eating big late night dinners. My weight stopped me from being active with my growing son. At my heaviest, I was north of 425 pounds. After years of resisting change, in 2018, I decided to quit drinking, but without other lifestyle changes, the weight stayed on. Two years later, I put the other pieces of the puzzle together, exercise and a healthier diet. At first, I couldn't last more than 10 minutes on my treadmill. Doctors said my lung capacity was at 30%. But with my son as my motivation, each day I walked a little further. After sharing my story in the Start Today group, it gave me a huge boost and a supportive community. Now, I haven't missed a day of walking in over three years. I'm proud to say I've lost 220 pounds, my lung capacity is back to 100%, and I'm the healthy father and husband I've always wanted to be. All right, so here's Nick a few years ago, and here's Nick there he is. now. Nick, come on out. Hey. Whoa. Oh my wow. goodness. Dude. Way to go, Nick. Congratulations. Thank you. It's nice Congrats, to meet you. Nick. Thank you. Really nice Good to meet morning. you. Good morning. Congratulations. Thanks for nice coming in. Thank you, brother. Oh, Thanks right. for coming so in. Great. Have a sit down. Hey, yeah. so great, a great outfit, too. Well, yeah. Nice yeah. pop of color. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Great. So, Nick, I, all of us who struggle with the, the weight that we've had, uh, there's a moment that says, you know what? I, I'm done. Enough is enough. It's either going to be one way or the other. I got to do something. What was it for you? 
you know, I just got tired of not being able to do anything. You know, I have my son and, you know, watching him grow up and being like, I, I can't do anything. You want to have a cat? Beautiful your son? family. What's his name? His name's Ryland. And what's your wife's name? Liz. Hi, guys. Okay. Hi, guys. Hi guys. <laughs> so, you know, I just got tired of saying, hey, you want to have a cat? You want to do this? No, no. Not because I didn't want to, because yeah. physically I you couldn't. couldn't. You no, couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah. So for so many people, the hardest part is getting started. But you actually say you have to start before you're even ready. What does that mean? So I know it's cliche, but I always says, I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. wow. Until you decide that, that today is that tomorrow, it's never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to say, I'm going to do it and do it and stick to it. I read that you have milestone. It missed walking in over three years. No, I mean, I walked five miles before I came on here this morning. Are you Whoa. serious? Yeah, I already got my 10,000 steps in. Wow. I already a thousand do calories. Feel, do you feel like you have a new lease on life? Like I was reading, you know, you're surfing, golfing, skateboarding, like all the things perhaps that you couldn't do before. Are you kind of have a why not attitude now, huh? Yeah, you know, because when I was younger, you know, I was very active. Mm -hmm. Certainly like said surfing, skateboarding, BMX riding. And in all those years, I, mean, I couldn't do you. anything. Look at wow. you! Yeah, wow. so, you know, it's kind of like I'm, I have a new lease on life, as you yeah. say, and I'm trying to pick up where I left off. Yeah. But I'm going to be honest with you, it's not like riding a bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm 52 now, and <laughs> when I was 24, I could jump on a skateboard. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's not like that anymore. And falling yeah. is a little different now. The funny thing was, you know, when I turned 50, I told my son, if I lose the weight, I'll ride BMX with you. So we were in Pittsburgh for a race, and I said, all right, let's do it. Long story short. I ended up in the trauma unit for two days. Oh. No. Broken ribs, punctured oh, bones. Yeah. Oh. So you got slow Maybe down. stay there with the walk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> walk is yeah, safer. safer. You mentioned your son, and we just showed a picture of him. We could show another one because they are just adorable. When you lost the weight, how did that change the relationship with, with your family? Well, obviously, it changed it for the better because as a family, you like to do stuff as a unit. Yeah. yeah. And I was always the odd man out because mm -hmm. I couldn't be part of that unit because I, I physically couldn't. But now I can do whatever I want. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, d d talk next for me, the Start Today group on Facebook. What, what has that meant for you? You know, it was funny because I didn't really know about it until I saw it one day with the walking challenge. And I started reading into it. And I'm like, you know what, this is a, a great group. You know, I could share my story and hopefully, you know, other people we can connect and you know, if it helps one person, yeah. then it's, it's worth it. Yeah. And I go on there and I always check and, you know, reply. And it's just a, it's a great group. And the people in there seem to be very genuine and they're great. It's just yeah. an awesome thing. It's a terrific family. It's so yeah. good. Well, thank you. And Way so, to go. So yeah, glad your family's not doing great. That's fantastic. Yeah, so Nick, thank you so much. Coming up, we're going to meet two more members of our community to find out how they change their lives one step at a time and tips on how we can all do it, too. We'll right back after these messages.
We're back with more Start Today. Now, we started this group a few years ago, and we cannot believe how much this community has grown. So many of our members sharing their stories with us, and we can't wait to introduce you to Melissa Palouche. What started off as a weight loss journey turned into so much more. While tracking her progress, she discovered the importance of non-scale victories, such as sleeping better, being able to walk up three flights of stairs without losing her breath. Let's take a look at Melissa's story and her advice to help others. I'm Melissa Paluch, a happily married mother of three. For most of my adulthood, I struggled with my weight. I avoided seeing a doctor for years because I didn't want to see the number on the scale. Finally, in June 2022, I got my blood work done and the results were not good. I was diagnosed with diabetes, high blood pressure, severe sleep apnea, and high cholesterol. At 43 years old, I was on more medication than my 83-year-old father. I woke up on July 1st last year and knew I had to make a change. So I switched up my diet and started counting calories. Reading posts on the Start Today Facebook page inspired me to exercise and I thought if others can do it, I can too. I started walking with my 18-year-old son and in eight weeks, I was able to walk a mile without getting winded. Now, one year later, I'm happy to announce I've lost 100 pounds and I feel incredible. All right, so here's a photo of Melissa on July 1st of last year. And here is Melissa now. Come on out. All right, Melissa. Yay, Melissa. Good morning. Congratulations. Oh, you, you look incredible. It. Thank How you. are you? Hi, welcome, you. welcome. Thank you. Hugs from afar. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Oh, Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, you know. it's one thing to set a goal for yourself, yes. but it's another to all of a sudden notice, hey, I think I'm going to reach this goal. Yes. How are you feeling? I feel amazing. I still I sometimes can't even believe that I did it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't believe I did this, but I'm like with, I had the motivation, I had the perseverance, I was doing it. And I did it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well, we heard you. Look at this picture. Isn't wow. this great? When you see that, what do you think? Oh, I can't even believe it. <laughs> I'm like, I still look to this day. Sometimes I still like look and I'm like, that's me. It's like, I can't even believe it. I did that. Like, you. I learned something from you because oh, I've never heard of an NSV. It means non-scale yes. victories. You celebrate those. Can you share some examples of what, of what that really means? Well, I can cross my legs again. Ah. Wow. <laughs> that's one. Um, I can paint my toes again, mm -hmm. which seems so silly. Mm -hmm. But my favorite one is that I'm actually exploring colors. As you can see in the picture, I'm wearing colors. Right. Where before I was always Aww. wearing like shades of gray, oh, wow. black, navy blue. Mm -hmm. How special and now is I'm that? Like, no, now my, my closet is colorful now. <laughs> and I love this green top you have on. Yeah, yeah. another new one. <laughs> well, on, this, on this journey, Melissa, I got to think, everybody who's been on this kind of journey, you, there's a certain point where you, you hit that plateau. Yes. And it can be very frustrating. No matter what you do, you just can't seem to break through. What, what's your advice? How, did you, how do you break those, 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 those moments? Uh, well, I hit two of them so far. And I did get discouraged at first, mm -hmm. but then I told myself, I'm like, you know what? You didn't come this far to go backwards again. So the first time I did it, I started drinking some more water. Mm -hmm. I figured, let me try that. That worked. It worked? It worked. As soon as mm -hmm. I added some more water to it, I started actually like picking up again just like that. Oh, I was wow. amazed. So that was really good. So I was excited. But in the past, that used to, that would deter me. Like as soon as mm -hmm. I hit a plateau, I'd be like, oh, well, Oh, well. yeah, not working. It's, it's not working anymore. I guess I'm supposed to be this way forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I would stop. Yeah. And I'm like, nope, not anymore. I'm going. like, now I'm like, I have to keep going. I have, if I want to be here, I have to. Yeah. So I'm like, I have no choice. We mentioned the colors in your wardrobe, which I think could be indicative of your mental health through this oh, whole yes. journey. How would you say you're feeling today compared to a year ago? So much happier. Hmm. I was actually saying that my husband told me the other day I have more pep. Hmm. And oh, I did man. before, and I was like, yep, I actually wake up in the morning, and I'm happy to get up in the morning. I'm yeah. not laying in bed because I don't want to get out of bed, mm -hmm. which is huge. Because I would lay there some days like, nope, don't even want to get up. Mm. I'm like, wow. I just want to stay here. Now I'm like, I want to do things. I look forward to getting up, and I look forward to walking mm -hmm. and, like, getting outside and doing things. So it's great. It's huge. You know, Al talked about this Start Today community so long ago, right? And it's been so rewarding to step back and watch all of you. seems like you guys have really bonded in cities all over the country. I've made a ton of friends in that group. Mm. I've never met them, but we've become social media friends. Uh -huh. And I'm like, even today, they were all messaging me like, good luck, uh -huh. we're so happy for you, you inspire us. And I'm like, I feel like they're, I honestly, most of them feel like they're family to me mm -hmm. now. That's like amazing. we've gotten very close. So I'm like, hopefully one day I can meet them, but yeah. you know. <laughs> so maybe there's somebody sitting at home right now, Melissa, who, who's, you know, had that problem of trying to get up and get out and get take those first steps, because mm -hmm. you were there. Yes. What, what would you say to that person watching right now? 
just get up and do it. I was walking mm -hmm. a half a mile for like two months, but you mm -hmm. know what? It was a half a mile more than what I was doing. Mm -hmm. That's all you can do. Do it. it. Doesn't any little bit of movement is important. So as long as you get up and move, yeah, it's better than nothing at all, and it's more than what you were doing the day before that. The day before that is the way <laughs> I looked at it. And eventually, it's like you're going to get to whatever your goals are. It may take a while, but you'll get there. Yeah. How's it been for your family watching this for you? Good. Very good. They're very mm -hmm. excited. Very, very excited. They're constantly telling me, like, you're a whole new person. We can't believe it. We're so happy for incredible. you. Like, just the health changes alone have been huge. Because sure. yeah. so. you can't be there for your family unless you're there for That's yourself. That's exactly right. what I told myself. I'm like, I have three kids. Like, if mm -hmm. I want to see them get married and maybe have kids one day, I'm like, I have to do something yeah, because be it's not getting you, any better. You are such an inspiration. And thank so many you. people sitting at home now can look at you and it's like, okay, I can walk a half a mile today. Yes, yep. so yeah, that's you. all you need to do just yeah. to get started. And it's not even thank, that. Just yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you so much thank for sharing you. your story. Just ahead, we are going to meet a dad of two to find out how an unexpected wake-up call changed his life. We'll be right back. We're back and continuing to highlight folks who have made incredible transformation. And this next guy is no exception. Back in 2021, Bayar Bayar Sekhan got an unexpected wake-up call when he received a life-threatening health diagnosis. As a dad of two young boys, Bayar decided to make a change. He started eating healthier and switched to a more active lifestyle. Since then, he has lost nearly half his body weight. Bayar visited our show last year to share his amazing transformation and how it actually inspired his kids. For most of my life, I've always been overweight. At my heaviest, I weighed 500 pounds. I often felt so tired that I would have to sit down to do the dishes or tell my kids that I was too exhausted to play with them. My wife would encourage me to start walking, but I lost interest in doing anything. In January 2021, I finally paid a visit to my doctor. I was diagnosed with a severe high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. And then he told me I was only expected to live until my 40s. That was the moment I knew I had to make a change. So I switched up my diet, but my biggest challenge was that I was addicted to sugar. I usually consumed about 200 grams of sugar a day. Over time, I learned how to control my portions, which slowly killed my cravings. I started walking, running, swimming, and eventually started strength training. Last summer, I even completed my first triathlon. Today, I have lost nearly half of my body weight, shedding 230 pounds in two years, and I have never felt better. Wow. This is quite the transformation. So we want to pull out this picture here. This was by our two years ago. Okay. And he's with us here. Here is Bayar now. We're here. Oh my goodness. Hi. Wow. Hi, look at you. Hey, hey. How are you? Thank you for coming. Hey, Congratulations. Hey, Hi. Thank you. Hello. So nice to meet nice you and to have you here. Thank you for coming. Have a sit down. Thank you. Yes. So, great. I mean, you look great. I know. How are you feeling? Do you feel as great as you look? I definitely do. I mean, the feeling of it's it's actually amazing. And then wow. I want to share it. 
I yeah, love that. As you should, and you know, not just share it with your beautiful family, but to share it with everyone watching. So let's get into the nitty gritty here because you you admitted in that spot that sugar was your weakness. You craved sugar. You couldn't give up sugar. So how were you able to curb that craving? Uh, I mean, it takes a time. It took me a definite a lot of days and years and months. I mean, months and years right now. Mm -hmm. um, I learned how to temper it down because as a as a human being, you cannot just stop everything at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Because your your brain is not actually meant to do that. Mm -hmm. So it takes time, but like I had to cut it little by little, mm -hmm. and that's how it started. Yeah. So you went to the doctor initially, I read, or one of the reasons was because you were really tired all the time. Was the weight affecting your sleep? Yes. So. Um, as, as I, I mean, what I was experiencing was like, I, I had to actually take naps. Hmm. My, my naps was not even regular naps. So like I had to take two hours. You were like naps. sleeping. I was like sleeping for yeah. two hours in the afternoons every mm. single day, even at jobs on my chairs. Mm. Wow. And then it was crazy. Mm -hmm. you, and you were someone who never exercised before. And then all of a sudden you, do, you start with the strength training and then I read that you actually competed in a triathlon. That's amazing. And, and now is it true you're training for another one? Yes, yeah, so last year I did a nine mile, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. This year I'm doing a 32 miles. Wow. Yes. Challenging myself. Wow. 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 When is that? Are you ready for it? August 27th. It's coming up. It's coming up, mm -hmm. so I'm actually about to start my sessions soon. Wow. For wow. the training. Good for you. How old are your kids? I have a five and a nine year old. A five and a nine. So your kids old enough to understand what daddy has been through and his oh, journey? Oh, they, they are so motivated by me that they are actually like, doing something on their own right now, like mm. the push-ups and stuff. Like, oh. they see me doing it, now they're mm. doing it on their own without even me telling them. You're that example for them. Yeah. Well, how would you say your mental health is tied into mm. your weight loss? Uh, it has definitely changed my life because when I was obese, I mean, I was morbidly obese, so when I was at this stage, I was lazy. I did not have motivation to do anything. Um, no short-term, long-term goals thinking about it. I just mm. learned to just live day to day. Mm. But now today, I'm like more motivated to do things and inspire and especially my mental health has been to the point where like, even like in this simple task, like remembering things, it changes lives. Because really? mm. when you're obese, your brain does not work the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. and you don't even remember things like for like your tasks. Mm -hmm. So even like simple like that. Wow, I love it. We talk a lot about health and wellness on this show. And I think for all of us, we all agree. It's not about the number on the scale, right? right? We know a lot of folks who, you know, our weight fluctuates or have you. But what would you say is the takeaway for people watching at home? It's more than just pounds, isn't it? It's more than just weight. It is definitely more than just the weights. Like right now I'm going through a situation where I'm shrinking, but the pounds are staying the same. So mm. uh, I have learned that people are getting dismotivated by the scale. So mm. I would definitely tell people not to do that. Mm. Uh, I would like to motivate people just take the process, keep going, stay consistent with it, but definitely find your motivation. Mm -hmm. What motivates you? Uh, that's the key to yeah. it. Yeah. Well done, sir. I know. Yeah, well done. So proud. And I know your, your wife and kids are too. Yes. Right, thank great. you so much. That was good. A big thank you to our community members for sharing their stories with us. We hope this has inspired you to embrace your own health journey. And that wraps up this episode of Star Today. Don't forget, scan the QR code to sign up for our newsletter. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time on Today All Day. today's checklist and this morning we are uh, we are going to help take help you take charge of your health by talking food breaking down the nutrients that you need right now and in the right amounts also so joining us this morning is Vanessa Rosetto registered dietitian and CEO of Kulina Health good morning Vanessa good morning. Thanks for joining us yeah. it's so nice to have Thanks you here for having me. and I think it's so important um, you know when we talk about all this stuff it's like you think oh this is good for you but how much are you supposed to be taking in and is it different for men and women so we're gonna start today with fiber yeah so this is one that is actually there are differences for men and women so 
men should have about 35 grams and women okay. about 28 grams. But when I say, hey, get 28 grams of fiber, you're like, cool, where? What does that even How? mean? How? Yes. Exactly. And you know, fiber is good for gut health. It's good for weight management. And so easy ways for me, I always think like more bang for my buck. Okay. So two grams of, uh, two tablespoons of chia are 11 grams of fiber. Oh, so you add that, add that to your oats, which are four mm -hmm. grams, right? And so now we're at 15. Then we're going to have. And this stuff all has fiber too? All has fiber. Dark chocolate. Dark chocolate and... blows everyone's mind. 85% or over yeah. has about three or four grams of fiber. Take a little piece of that. Right? Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, wow, that is the hardest dark chocolate <laughs> I've ever had. Also, okay. one cup of raspberries mm -hmm. is eight grams of fiber. Okay. So, you know, if you want to just like add something extra to your oats, just toss it in. It's the easiest exactly. way to do it. Exactly. Pistachios, edamame, all exactly. examples. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. Let's fiber. talk about vegetables. Can't talk. It, we can't do this segment without vegetables. You need vegetables. Right. Everyone needs. While them. I chump on my dark yes. chocolate. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How much? So I like to say one cup of vegetables at lunch and dinner. Doesn't have to be roasted broccoli mm -hmm. or you know roasted edamame. Right. We can just cut up carrots, right. cut up celery, cut up red bell peppers. Is raw best? Depends on yeah. what's good, what your stomach can take. Yeah. So yeah, if you can tolerate raw vegetables, that's awesome. If you want to cook them down because that's a little bit easier for mm -hmm. you, that's okay too. Right. But it doesn't have to be you know shaved parmesan and olive oil and roasted for 30 minutes. It's just cut them up, put them on the side, keep it going. You could even munch in those in the, during the day, that's right? right? That's yeah. right. That's yep. right. For those people who do that whole all day exactly. eating thing. Exactly. And you can <laughs> add some cheese with it yeah. to help you, okay. make, help you get full. So all it's right. really great. So here's the next thing. Right. I see so many people in this building who walk around yes. with these things of water yes. this big. Yes, and good for that, them. Right. <laughs> If they, if, they, if they don't get to the bottom, they feel like it's they're a failure. <laughs> yeah. How much water? 90 <laughs> ounces? Yeah, so I'm looking for 90 ounces a day, which could be a little bit difficult, but many of us are working at home, so we have easy access to a restroom if you need. Good point. <laughs> Sometimes that bothers people. But actually, some quick ways for you to get hydration in, you can just add a pinch of Himalayan sea salt. That helps with electrolytes and helps to keep you feeling really? more hydrated. Yep. Himalayan sea salt? Himalayan sea salt, okay. yeah, so you don't have to worry too too much right. about you know the 90 ounces if it's a little bit taxing. Well, that's kind of the good salt. Let's talk about the not so good salt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny because the thing is, it's not just table salt. There's sodium in so many of our products. Sodium is everywhere. Yeah. Um, and if you have some issues with blood pressure or things like that, you want to pay attention. So the American Heart Association recommends one teaspoon, about 2,300 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Salt is hidden everywhere. So a day. A day. A teaspoon a day. And so here's the thing: most people eat fresh food, right? Yeah. And so if you are eating canned soups, you want to look. For things that are low sodium, you yeah. can also get low sodium cold cuts. Yeah. It's just being mindful of those words so that you don't overdo it. All right, since we're talking about goals and 2023, healthy eating, all of this, this is where I mess up snacks. My snacks aren't right. I already know. Well, <laughs> you got to get your snacks yeah, my lined snacks up right. Just, well, I got to get it in order. Well, what happens is people are looking for snacks that are already processed and yummy package, and yummy no, I'm yes kidding. i'm always looking for things if it's not delicious we're not eating it right, right and so sometimes you'll get a bar and the bar will be 300 calories and maybe that might be a little bit over mm -hmm. so you could do the dark chocolate with 15 almonds so okay. there's fiber and there's protein and there's fat that's not bad that's going to hold you over so i'm always looking for more than 150 calories but no more than 200. so between 150 and 200. yeah is this where i'm supposed to live this or is, this is where you can is live this home yeah this is home so, okay and so here's a fun <laughs> way because eggs maybe by themselves are a little bit boring just a little so we can add a little hot sauce. We can add everything with the bagel seasoning. Okay. It's very delicious. But also, we can always go back to the dark chocolate okay. and the almonds for something fun. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Welcome See? to my home, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Doritos. Oh, no. No, no. Eggs. And eggs. Mm, Vanessa, yum. That was great. Thank, Thank you, you, Vanessa. So
back. Another edition of Superfood Friday SOS. This is where we answer your questions. And to do it, we brought in the expert. Today, nutrition and health expert Joy Bowers here to break them down, to share some helpful, healthy eating strategies. Right. Always good to have you. Let's dig in. Here's our first question from a viewer. Hi, Joy. I'm Ina Espinoza from Ann Arbor, Michigan. How much protein should I be eating? Oh, good question. Yeah. yeah, and so we spend so much time talking about why protein is important. It helps with our muscles, our tissues, keeps our appetite in check, jacks up our energy levels. But we don't talk about how much we should be eating right. each day. So I really appreciate this, this question. Here's the easiest way to figure out how much you need. Take your weight in pounds, divide it in half, and that's about how much protein you should be eating each and every day. It's oh not an exact ounces, science. Obviously. In ounces, In grams. In grams. In grams. So it's not an exact science, but it's a really good reference number. So, for example, if you weigh 140 pounds, you want to aim to eat 70 grams of protein wow. each and Never every day. That. Yeah. Never, Never knew it. And also, um, I should <clears throat> say that you need a little bit more if you're pregnant, if you're nursing, or if you're a serious athlete. And these are some foods that are rich Yeah, in so protein. the good news is that there, there's so many foods that have a lot of protein. So for example, um, a cup of cottage cheese has about 24 grams of protein. This is Greek yogurt. A cup has about anywhere from 15 to 18 grams. Two tablespoons of peanut butter, about eight grams. An egg, six grams. A cup of beans has a lot, or lentils. This is a palm size or a deck of cards for chicken, fish, or meat, 21 grams. And when you think about it, we probably have double this yeah. for lunch and dinner. Let's so, talk about these yeah. next foods here because we've got a viewer question related to heart health. Okay. Let's take a listen. Hey, Joy, this is Steve from Westchester, New York. I was just wondering if there are any specific foods that I might be able to eat to help me lower cholesterol. That's a great question. Yeah. So diet has a huge impact on our cholesterol level. And in order to lower our cholesterol numbers, first you want to minimize saturated fat, refined carbs, and added sugar. And I know that's easier said than done, but it's really important. But the good news is that there are actually foods that have cholesterol-lowering capabilities. And I geek out over this because yeah. it really illustrates the power of the healthy food. eating. Yeah. So first I'm going to start by saying that there's a type of fiber called soluble fiber, yeah. and it has the capability of latching on to circulating cholesterol and escorting it out of our body. And you find it in things like like apples, avocado, oats, these are chia, chia seeds, seeds. Um, lentils chia and beans. Here I'm showing pistachio nuts because pistachio nuts as well as sunflower seeds, they have this natural occurring plant-based compound called mm. plant stanols or sterols. Mm. And all you need to know is that that helps to block the absorption oh, wow. of cholesterol. I so love pistachios. These are the it's things you want to put Joy. onto your menu. Very, very yeah. helpful. Sunflower seeds also help keep you awake on a road trip. That's true. Oh. <laughs> Who knew there was a it's car in the studio? <laughs> okay. Now we have a question about chocolate. I know that dark chocolate is healthier than milk chocolate, and I want to switch. What percent should I look for in the grocery store? Thanks so much, Joy. All that's nice. <laughs> so sweet. We... Yeah, sometimes if you get too much dark chocolate, it, it's bitter. That's right. So, like, as a general guideline, the darker the chocolate, the higher the percentage of cacao or cocoa, mm -hmm. the greater the health perks. But it's not as easy as just going to the store and buying the highest percentage because then you don't have that out of this world indulgent chocolate mm -hmm. experience. So what I like to do is, first off, we're showing here the middle ground. So this is between 60 and 80 percent, okay. I think, oh, so is the be sweet good. spot because oh, good job, right? it delivers the health promoting flavanols, but it also mm. is gently sweet and it has that yeah. melt in your mouth deliciousness. Mm -hmm. I would tell people to start at 60 yeah. percent and then slowly work your way up and yeah. see where your palate prefers. 70 is great. I love like 72 percent mm -hmm. and there's Ooh. a lot of great brands out there. If you're only looking for pure health, okay. you could go for the gusto. 80 plus percent, Ooh. but I'm just going to tell you it's going to be intense. It's going to be that's dark. a lot. It's, it's not, not as gonna... sweet and indulgent. Yes. Fine. All right. So okay. next we're talking. I think sodium. Let's listen to our last question. Hi, Joy. This is Darby and Mango from Austin, Texas. I wanted to reach out about salty foods and why they make me swollen. I've always heard this happens, but why does it happen and how long does it usually last? That's a great question. We have a saying in my office where sodium goes 
water flows. Ah. This is a real thing. So it is. I've learned my lesson in the morning. <laughs> the sodium, sodium is a component of salt. Okay. And when you eat a salty meal, that sodium draws in water okay. and you're going to feel it in your fingers. Sometimes yep. you get a swollen face, face, puffiness around the belly. The good news is it will usually ease up in 24 hours or so. Okay. And you can also expedite the process by drinking a lot of flat water okay. and eating potassium rich foods. Oh, shoot, we're out of time, so let's hurry. Okay, okay. So, so some of the oh. most more surprising places that okay. you would get sodium, we have, you know, the like sausage, sausages, meat, jerky, yep, yep. shrimp is shrimp? really salty, shrimp? bread. Really? Bread has a ton. And obviously, restaurant meals, they pack in the salt. Okay. So For you just want to be mindful. Cholesterol lowering recipes, it's today.com slash food. We'll be right back. Thank you. I like something. We're back, Eat 52 now, with more of our heart health series. And we just showed you the importance of exercise, but there's, of course, another key factor, what you eat. The Cleveland Clinic just released results from its annual National Heart Survey, and the response to, to what posed the greatest barrier to getting healthy really caught our attention. Check this out. Nearly half of Americans surveyed said they viewed healthy food as more expensive. So we wanted to try and, and debunk that assumption. So we're going to do that this morning. And to help us do that, Vanessa Rosetta, registered dietitian. Good to have you back. Thanks for having me. This has been a misconception in a lot of communities for, I think, a long time. The idea that healthy has to be expensive, but you maintain not so. Not so. This is why dietitians exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of tips and tricks for you to be eating healthy. So, for example, people always think, you know, f vegetables and fruit are super expensive mm -hmm. and that you can only eat organic. Well, actually, you know, the dollar store has frozen fruits and vegetables for sale for one dollar. Wow. So if you want to have vegetables in your life and you are afraid or you don't have time or, you know, cost is a problem for you, yeah. you can go to the dollar store and you can get a bag of carrots or a frozen bag of berries. And to be clear, there's the same nutritional value in frozen fruits and vegetables that, as, as raw. That's right. And actually minimal processing. So they're allowed to ripen to peak and then flash frozen. So... It's up for grabs. Okay. Yeah. Oatmeal bakes. Oh, that's what I do. I make these oatmeal bakes for my kids. I yeah. want them to eat oatmeal, and I dump the frozen fruit in there, and I bake it, and they think I'm a genius. They add peanut butter. We've got fat. We've got protein. We've got fiber. We've got antioxidants. Yeah. And I'm a winner. And it's pretty simple. Yeah. All right, let's talk about, we've covered fruits. Let's talk about veggies now. You've got a simple trick for veggies as well. So find the ones that you like. Yeah. My son only likes carrots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you get them in bulk on a Sunday. You cut them up. You put them in water in a glass container, or for my kids, we just put them in Ziploc bags because they're grabbing yeah. and going. Yeah. 
That's so buy in bulk is a secret. It's the secret, and they, you go through it pretty quick. And you also mentioned to buy non-starch veggies. Yeah, so non-starchy veggies help to keep you full. They he help your gut be healthy, which helps for immunity. It's winter, so people are getting more sick. So more vegetables help you be better for longer. And a few examples of non-starch veggies. Yeah, so carrots, celery, arugula, spinach. There's again one of the greatest misconceptions, perhaps seafood, expensive. Well, it can be expensive yeah. if you're going to go to, you know, a fishmonger and you're going to buy $30 a pound halibut or, you know, salmon. But if you don't want to do that, and also people are a little bit weird about fish yes. as, um, as a leftover. Yeah. So buying them in bulk, you can get them at the regular grocer or you can get them at, you know, a Sam's or a Costco. And so now you're just getting one piece at a time. You can defrost before you leave the house, put it in the fridge. When you get home, it'll be ready olive oil, some Dijon mustard in the air fryer, and you had one perfect piece, so you're not wasting. And these are packed with omega-3s. Omega-3s is for your cardiovascular health, yeah. for your brain health, reduces the risk of cancer. A lot of recipes, of course, call for butter, the call for olive oil. How do we save there? So, I buy in bulk. You can get two to three pounds. I know that is, that is quite the large can. That's quite the large container of olive oil. Yes. You're right. Also, you know, you can get online just a container that will allow you to pour, perfectly like portion that out. So you could fill it up and then hide that so you don't have to look at it. It's about sixteen to twenty dollars depending okay. on the weight that you have. And remember, the serving size of olive oil, you know, is still one tablespoon. So we know it has anti-inflammatory properties, but one tablespoon is sufficient. All right, let's talk about really quickly here, saving money on snacking as well. So I'm a dietitian, so snacking is oh, how snacking, I live snack. my life. This okay, is, good. I'm always thinking about the snacks that I'm having. Uh, I love to go to any kind of pharmacy to get the deals. So the two for one for the yeah, nuts or you. the chickpeas, fiber. I'm always looking for fiber and protein. But also, I will always die on the sword of chocolate, which is my favorite thing. I eat it every single day. It has fat, it has protein, and if you get over 85%, it also has fiber. So, Vanessa, thank you. Thank you. back on the third hour of today with another edition of Superfood Friday SOS. Today, nutrition and health expert Joy Bauer is here to answer your superfood questions. Hey, Joy. Hi, Joy. Good hey. to see Hi, you. Fridays. Okay, we've got our first question okay. from Lily in New York, and it's something I think we can all relate to. Lily? I seem to always hit a wall around 3 p.m. and start feeling so tired. What are the best foods and drinks to help with the afternoon slump? Thank you. Oh, question. Mm, so we've all experienced the yeah. dreaded yeah. afternoon slump. Um, it's frustrating, but it's quite normal, and there's a scientific explanation. It's all about our circadian rhythm, okay. which then triggers a drop in blood sugar, smack in the afternoon, and it's typically right between when we wake up in the morning and mm -hmm. when we go to sleep at night. The good mm. news is there's a few things we could do to perk ourselves up. First, sip some water. Hydration is very important. Right. And also consider a gentle hit of caffeine. You don't want to drink too much because it's going to interfere with sleep. So you can either do a cup of coffee that's a mix with mm -hmm. regular and decaf, okay. or I'm showing a cup of tea because that has half the caffeine of coffee. And definitely power up with energizing snacks. Okay. So these snacks are great for 
focus. They keep mm -hmm. us feeling sharp and sustain energy. It's an apple with string cheese, mm -hmm. or we have a rice cheese. cake mm -hmm. with some peanut butter or yogurt with berries. Okay. Here I'm showing Delicious. my budgie. These are energy These are bites, delicious. and I have two different versions. So this is a chocolate peanut butter, okay. mm. and this I gave it an extra kick with some espresso powder. Oh. Mm. So if you want to jolt from the caffeine. Just the powder? Um, yeah, I add mm. in the powder with a whole bunch of things like rolled oats, and I have chia seeds mm. and nut butter, mm. and it's so simple. And That's the good, good thing is you make a great big batch. It lasts in the refrigerator for weeks mm. and weeks, good. and it'll lift it you like up. Candy. I know, it's it good. It tastes Almost a little like bit like a brownie. Mm -hmm. All right, mm. so next we have a question for all of the tea drinkers out there like myself. Take a listen. Joy, this is Melanie from Denver, Colorado. My question for you today is about tea. I drink a lot of tea and there are a lot of options. Green, chamomile, black, and I'm wondering what you think is best. That's a good question. Thank you. Ooh, yeah. I don't know the difference. Question. It's a great question. And truly, it's impossible to pick just one sure. tea because there are so many great varieties. Mm -hmm. But here are the standouts. So black, white, and oolong tea are packed with antioxidants, and they help to fight inflammation, which means that it's also going to reduce the risk for a laundry list of conditions like heart disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes. Chamomile tea is great if you're feeling frazzled because it helps to hmm, ease stress and anxiety. Green tea is which one am a I drinking? super food in its own right. I don't even know. I don't either. Um, but green tea we'll has all of the tea. antioxidants that black tea has, but also this it can help to protect English and breakfast? promote skin health. Oh. And some studies show that it has a modest assistance with weight loss as well. Hmm. And then we also have turmeric and ginger. Fantastic if you're dealing with aches and pains from exercise or arthritis. Okay. And the last one is peppermint. I peppermint love is peppermint. great for oh. IBS. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Peppermint can help with gas and stomach discomfort oh, and distension. Wow. But not with heartburn. As Ted Lasso <laughs> says, I used to think tea was just brown, dirty water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much is. Right, we got two minutes. <laughs> We love anything Ted Lasso says. <laughs> All right, what's this next one here? This one uh, for you, Craig. Oh, yeah, we've got a question here from <laughs> someone who's trying to get in shape for the summer. Hey, Joy. My name is David Rodriguez from Miami, Florida. I work out a few times a week for about an hour per session, and I was wondering, what are the best foods to eat before I exercise? Thank you. Okay. So That's contrary to what a lot of people think, you do not need to eat anything before a bout of moderate exercise. And I mm. would define that as an hour or less. So it's really a personal choice. Wait, an hour of exercise is moderate? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So if, <laughs> if, if your you joy bower it is. <laughs> If you feel energized and strong without eating anything on an mm -hmm. empty stomach, go to it. But if you feel jittery and you need a little bit of mm -hmm. umph, mm -hmm. the name of the game is keep it light. So mm -hmm. one of the most perfect snacks, I'm showing a banana yeah. because it's totable, it is easy to digest, mm -hmm. and it also contains a lot of potassium, which is an electrolyte that we tend to lose through good. sweat when we exercise. Mm -hmm. And I also have a cup of coffee because 30 to 60 minutes before, mm -hmm. a cup of coffee can actually help you work out Longer oh, and stronger. Gives you the energy. Right. Yes. I imagine. Yeah. Uh, right. This next one is um, from Marcy in Connecticut, having to do with acid reflux. Okay. Yeah. I suffer with acid reflux, and I was wondering if there are any foods that might soothe it, or any foods that um, I can avoid. I really need some help. So if you have any information, I'd really appreciate it. Hmm. There are no magic foods that can help minimize acid reflux, but there are a lot of things that you could do to make yourself feel better. Okay. I think the first thing is to eat smaller meals because mm -hmm. larger meals puts pressure on the stomach walls, which increases stomach acid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second thing is to not lie down after eating. Right. Um, so wait at least three hours after eating dinner because it's easy then for the food to travel up. Mm -hmm. And in terms of trigger foods, okay. you want to avoid bubbly beverages, mm -hmm. avoid alcohol, avoid caffeine. Yeah. Sorry about the mm -hmm. coffee thing. And also acidic foods like we're showing here, tomato sauce, oh. the citrus fruits, mm -hmm. heavy uh -huh. rich meals. And ironically, I'm showing peppermint over there because peppermint and chocolate can relax the sphincter mm. in the esophagus mm. and make it more likely that the food is going to come up. So peppermint so is good for IBS, but not for suffer. reflux. Really yes. okay. And probably you know check with things. your doctor. Yes. Yeah, these Definitely guys. check with your doctor. And there's great medications uh, that help, obviously. Mm. Well, thank you, Joy. Thank you. Thank you. Joy. Head to today.com slash food for the recipes for Joy's chocolate peanut Those butter, energy bites, mm. and the espresso bites. This morning on today's checklist, we are going to take a closer look at our gut health. What's the difference between, this is good, yeah. probiotics, 
prebiotics, and then something I just learned about today, postbiotics. So here to help us is registered dietitian and CEO of Kalina Health, Vanessa Rosetto. Hi. Vanessa, welcome. Nice to see you. So let's first just tackle this. Let's talk about why gut health is so important. We're hearing more and more about it lately. Sure. So gut health is important because it helps you to regulate your immunity. It helps with your mental health. So that beneficial bacteria is really going to help you be well. But metabolism the, too? Metabolism too, which okay. also gets everybody very turned up. Yep. We're excited. Maybe. I'm excited. But the research is still ongoing, right? Mm. So we don't exactly know what is right and what isn't. We think we know what a healthy microbiome looks like. Okay. But the other thing to remember is that your gut microbiome changes every 60 days due to environmental factors, any kind of stress, any kind of antibiotics that you're on. Okay. So taking probiotics every single day may or may not be may the best or, thing. Okay, so let's dig in because that's the thing. I always worry I'll mess something up. It's already messed up, yeah. but I don't want to make it worse. <laughs> okay, so we got, your turn. So we've got pickles, kimchi, uh, fermented things. Those are... Probiotics. Okay. So if you're not really interested in taking a pill that. every mm -hmm. single day, you yeah. don't have to. Actually, there was an article that just came out that said if you eat kimchi every single day for two and a half months, mm -hmm. that is just as good as taking a probiotic. Really? Mm -hmm. I love that. Yep. Well, I love kimchi. Yeah. So you could save your money. Mm -hmm. And like, there, there's pickles, there's kefir, there are chia seeds, there's cottage cheese, there's mm -hmm. sour cream. Again, kimchi. So you can find the thing that you like and you could save some money. All right. That's good and, kimchi. And Where do, it do, that? do it naturally. Do it naturally. Yes. So Enjoy if that. you are doing it naturally, it's, there is no reason to take an, a supplement. You can or you or you can't. It okay. just depends on what your symptoms are. So that's the other thing. You have to take the exact probiotic at the exact dose mm, okay. for the symptom that you have. So when someone says like, oh, I take this probiotic, it makes me feel great. That's great. But maybe that person has bloating and maybe uh, you have delayed digestion Something and so else. you need to take care of yourself okay. and whatever works for so you. So how do you work it into your daily routine? Eat fruits and vegetables. That's really <laughs> good. Right? Diversify what your intake is and then if you are having probiotics you want to have one every other day. You're introducing a new bacteria into your body. Right. That's okay. going on. <laughs> You're introducing a new bacteria into your body okay. and that might cause a lot of GI discomfort. So you want to take your time with that. And if it doesn't work for you, don't take it. Nothing bad's going to happen. And what is this with the antibiotics? Right. So the antibiotics are ridding you of all the bacteria in your body. So if you oh. take it together, there's no points. So you ah. want to separate. So if you take your antibiotic in the morning, then you want to have the probiotic. Oh, like don't later, take them together. Later on in the day. Yeah, you could still do Okay. Both. Yeah. Great. Uh, Mr. Roker's taking your advice yeah, just, clearly yeah. to heart. If anybody else hopefully, listen, hopefully, hopefully no one else wanted any pickles. I want his GI tract to be good. healthy and happy. Um, so let's talk about prebiotics for a moment since yeah. we just talked about probiotics. What are prebiotics and what are the, the health benefits to these? So prebiotics help the probiotics do their job, but you okay. cannot find them in supplement form. They come from indigestible complex carbohydrates. So you're thinking chicory root. If you had a bar that had 17 grams of fiber, that comes from something called or chicory. You also get it in oats, you get it in garlic, you get it in onions, asparagus. So eating that helps your probiotic do its job. Also helps with an absorption of calcium, which also helps the gut with more immunity. And you can't get this as, as a supplement? No, you cannot. Only from food. Not yet. Or never. 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 <laughs> never. Just the way that it's going to be broken down. That's so not so work. let's talk about these postbiotics, because again, this is a term that I was not familiar with in, until yesterday. But what are they? So postbiotics happen after the probiotic bacteria break down the fiber from a fruit and vegetable. Okay. But we don't really understand it. It's kind of a buzzword. You don't need to do anything special. Eat your fruits and vegetables. Also, you can find it in chocolate, in tea, or coffee. Okay. But the verdict's not out. So don't start searching the internet for postbiotics thinking it's going to make some kind of difference. It's better for you to go back to getting it naturally from foods, anything fermented, fruits and vegetables. Make sure you're drinking water. Yeah. Take vitamin D. Get your gut healthy, and you should be fine. So focus on prebiotics and well, probiotics. Prebiotics. But it probiotics. sounds like if you diversify what you eat, you're getting mm -hmm. all the necessary nutrients. Yes. Okay. Like <laughs> Vanessa, thank you you're so welcome. So much. This was good. For more information on gut health, just head to today.com. Are you done like binging on everything? Oh, these, like, these, these pistachios. The today. Those are Sicilian. Oh, it's very nice. Ooh. That's right. They make you an offer you can't maybe refuse. The, maybe, they know where my, <laughs> maybe they know where my luggage is. A good Tuesday morning. We're following a lot of breaking news overnight. We are indeed a passenger plane engulfed in flames and the desperate search for earthquake survivors. It is January the 2nd. This is Today. Terrifying images, a Japan Airlines flight